Yo, 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 what's up, guys? This is Wise Guys Podcast, episode 13. It's your boy, Jay Ray. I got Johnny T. I got B-Cap, and we got a surprise guest today. Another brother from CSB. We got JQ. We're going to break down some NFC, the NFC East today. We're going to talk about our top five running backs in the league right now. And should quarterbacks start day one? We're going to end it also with our two-minute drill. But before we get going, let me point something out. JQ here is probably the biggest Giants fan that I know. So it's it's a blast right now that we got him here to talk some NFC East football. What's up, guys? How we doing? Long time no see. Good to hear from you guys all. I appreciate you guys having me on the Wise Guys podcast. You were uh, our first guest. Oh, this is, oh, wow. This is awesome. We're going I, easily. I appreciate it. Wow, that warms my heart on a, on a Sunday <laughs> morning. Um, but I'm very excited. NFC East, obviously the, the best division in football, as everyone knows. Um, I'm just excited to break down some topics with you guys. And it's not like we were doing this before all the time at CBS. So let, let's get into it. Yeah, we had some pretty epic giant debates there, which is why I think we're going to segue this straight into this episode 13. We've been doing this now for almost, what is it, seven weeks? That's, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Justin, you want to kick us off? I was saying you should have you should have JQ bat off for the NFC East, but we're going to go starting off from the top all the way working down to the very bottom, right? So we're yeah. going to touch on his Giants last. Okay. So, make so, sure. All right. So, so pre, so pre-show Brandon automatically assumed that each and every one of us were going to have the same number one team. And already I could tell that's not the case. E A G L E S Eagles. I got them flying for first place, man. How could you not love their off season making a big move? They go all in on Jalen hurts. Jalen hurts is the guy. They trade for, for A.J. Brown. They sign Hassan Reddick in free agency. One of the sleeper moves is Kazir White from the Chargers, a Pro Bowl caliber linebacker. They got him on a one-year deal. Yo, the Eagles are primed and ready to go. They, they've taken some steps in the right direction. I love with what they're doing. And they're bringing back some alternate jerseys that, that are so fire. Come on, guys. It's the Eagles. Justin, you're familiar with James Bradbury, right? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Brandon, uh, Brandon, I'm not Brandon. Mix up the names. You got four of us in here. JQ, I'm sure you're also <laughs> even more familiar with him. That was my guy the past two years. Yeah, he's he was one of my you know top ten favorite players, top five favorite players on the Giants. He had some good years with us. Those two years he was there, he was a lockdown corner. He's very solid, and it just sucks to see him go. But you know, when you're in a cap hell, when your old GM leaves you with no money left, you know certain guys got to go. It's unfortunate, but. I think that pickup for the Eagles is great. And, you know, it stinks. I was sitting there on the night of the draft and I'm like, oh, like the Eagles. I was like, oh, the Eagles are on the clock. And I was like, oh, wait, they traded the pick or like whatever happened. And I was like, oh, no. And then like I saw it was like, oh, AJ Brown go to the Philadelphia. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, here we go. I was like, but I mean, you know, how we make some good moves as a GM over there in Philly. And I think th I think that team is poised for a playoff run. And I think it's going to be up to their quarterback. Can Hurts do it? But I think that overall team is the best like team in the NFC East. You got Dallas, which is a very good team. But I just think, I don't know, I think Philly's going to be a different beast this year. It's going to be tough to beat them. To me, I feel like you always, by the way, on a side note, I, I, meant to, I said, Justin, I'm sure you're familiar with James Bradbury. I met, I met JQ well, before. Well, I'm familiar too because I wanted him in New England. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the Steelers may even be a player for him, but – Philadelphia is a great fit. He's replacing former Steelers Steven Nelson uh, across from Darius Slat. I thought that was a good pickup for them. To me, though, the way you win games in the NFL is through the trenches. And I look at this Eagles defensive line. Javon Hargrave, stud. Fletcher Cox. Derek Barnett, sure, maybe hasn't lived up to expectation. He's back. Bryn Graham, Jordan Davis from Georgia. You get N'Kobe Dean, his, uh, his backer. And then, to, to me, on the offensive side of the ball, when healthy, this is easily one of the best offensive lines in the NFC. And you have one of the better running games by far, Jalen Hurts. Now, the, not only did the Eagles figure out how to run the football last year, pretty good at this thing, but you give Jalen a top 10 receiver in A.J. Brown, this is one of the most complete teams to me. I think they may have some holes here or there. There may be some players, at least some stuff to be desired. But overall, in this NFC... Like JQ said, the deciding factor at this team winning 12 games or, or nine by far is the progression Jalen Hurts takes in the second year as a starter because outside of him, I don't see a limiting factor with the way this team is built. And considering how good a first season 
their young head coach had last year as well. So, I mean, this is, to me, easily the team I have winning the NFC East, even with the Cowboys running things back again. Well, so I just want a uh, real quick, JQ, so do you also have the uh, Eagles winning the division or? Yes, I do. I do. Okay. I think it'll be okay. close. I think it'll be close, but yeah. I, don't know. I just think they're better. So I think this is their I th- year. I think, I think one thing we can have common ground is that I think that's, this division um, is going to be close. Especially with, I, I mean, in my opinion, I believe it's going to be close between Dallas, Philly, and Washington. Um, so just to hit on Philly, a, f- a fun fact that I, I, I didn't know, but uh, when it popped up, I, I uh, opened my eyes a little bit. The Eagles haven't had a 1,000-yard wide receiver in the last seven seasons. The last guy to do that was in 2014, was Jeremy playing, Macklin. I oh, <laughs> wanted oh, to guess it, sorry. Uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, Hopefully, uh, a healthy Devonta Smith or Devonte Smith um, uh, and or uh, AJ Brown can uh, produce to that level. I mean, we we all know AJ Brown's very capable of doing that. We've seen him do it in Tennessee year in year out. Uh, Devonte Smith, um, he's got to get it going. I, I think the one thing that is holding them back, and you know, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I feel like I've said it every single uh, uh, division breakdown we've done. I, I don't believe in the quarterback, so. Even when you tell me all those nice players that John mentioned, Fletcher uh, from Fletcher Cox to Brandon Graham, who me and uh, Justin know very well, he uh, made basically the uh, game-winning uh, sack uh, strip fumble on Tom Brady in the uh, Super Bowl. Uh, and then uh, Darius Slay in the uh, backfield. But um, again, when I look at it and I say, and, and um, uh, this just hit me up. Um, Hassan Reddick, they uh, they, uh, they signed that. That was a big free agent signing by um, the Philadelphia Eagles. He's had 23 and a half sacks in the last two seasons. That's going to really help out because the Eagles last year had 29 sacks all year and that ranked 31st in the NFL. So second to last. So that that's going to be a, a big help. But you tell me Jalen uh, Hurts is your quarterback. I, I'm, I'm just not going to buy in. He's not, he's not a good throw of the football. Let, let's be honest. He's not. Um, I, I, I know there are people that believe in his um, winning intangibles and his leadership skills, and, and that's all fine and dandy. But for me, if you – and that's, that's like a similar thing. I, when somebody says that and, and says not th- good throw of the football, my mind instantly goes to Tim Tebow. He, I would admit he's a better thrower than Tim Tebow, right? He's faster, um, not as physical as Tebow. Tebow was a, a tank, but – and we saw how Tebow uh, panned out. I mean, yeah, he was able to win games in the regular season, but when it counted in the playoffs, and I know he beat uh, – sorry, sore moment, but uh, Johnny T's uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. But then we saw him go against um, the New England Patriots, and, and it was a complete blowout. There, there was no competition there whatsoever. Uh, so – and last thing, they, they, uh, they got a new rookie uh, head coach in Philadelphia. Well, second season. Oh, second season? Yeah, yeah last okay, year okay, for him. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, but he, he, so he's still a newish head coach. I think this is a, a, a Jalen Hurts uh, make it or break it year. Uh, because if he doesn't succeed, like JQ touched on, they traded um, for AJ Brown, but they uh, also got an extra first round pick in 2023 from New Orleans. So now they got two first round picks next year, I think. I don't know. I ha- I'd have to look up that, but they, they, they've got the assets to move up. Basically, if Jalen Hurts doesn't pan out, they can move up next year and uh, draft a quarterback of the future. No, Brand, they're Jaylen- going to end up. You're good. Sorry. Sorry, Johnny. See, they're going to end up with like two, three picks next year because of those trades they did with Miami and San Francisco the years before. Okay. So yeah, that, okay. That trade yeah. for AJ Brown, it all, it all equals out. Howie's doing a great job over there. They're going to, they have like a lot of draft capital. So if something happens, they're, you know, they're, they're safe. They got, they got luxury and they got room to work with Johnny T go ahead. Say what you want. Jalen hurts has had games. I think back to Kansas city last year is playing from behind or he's thrown 300 plus yards. And when you look at the talent surrounding him, a player we didn't mention was Dallas Goddard, one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Like he has touched on Devonte Smith, Devonta. They have so much talent around him. I think it's similar to Tua in Miami where you can say, okay, Nick Sirianni had an impressive first year as a head coach. There's lower expectation press conference he had coming in. But overall, I I trust the head coach. I trust the guys in the trenches. 
And I think the defense is going to create more plays this year, along with the playmakers around him. They're surrounding not just the quarterback, but the running game, that this can be one of the most dynamic offenses. Jalen's ability as a runner, with his progression as a passer that you would expect, I wouldn't be surprised if he can maybe squeeze into the back end of the MVP race this year if the Eagles can win 12 or 13 games. I think this team is that well-rounded, and hey, if he puts up the numbers with the rushing and passing totals, I wouldn't say it's that crazy to say he can climb into that MVP discussion. Do I think he's going to win it? No. But maybe like top five and he gets some looks. That's his main. So ju- just to, just because um, you said, you know, he had a couple games of uh, 300 yards plus, but I- I'm looking at his stats right now, and there were some, some weeks at a time, like a span of a one, two, three, four, five weeks in a row where he posted under a, a 50 uh, QBR. Like it went a, a 10.1 QBR, a 39.2 QBR, 23.8 QBR, 45.8 and a 49.1 all, all in a row. Then he went a 94.4 QBR, but he only threw for 103 yards and had only threw the ball 14 times. So that, that wasn't really him, uh, you know, uh, doing much. Then he did a, a, then he had a 91 uh, QBR against the Chargers, which they lost that game. Again, he only threw for 162 yards and only threw the ball 17 times. Uh, that Then uh, he had a couple of good weeks in a row there. Then to, three games in a row basically to end the season, a 17.1 QBR, a 30.1 QBR, and then a 43.4 QBR. It's very inconsistent quarterback play. And if you're going to put up those kind of, that kind of QBR, it, it's going to be, it, it's going to negatively inf- uh, affect your team. And I don't know if the Eagles as a team can overcome uh, Jalen Hurts not, you know, producing, uh, throwing the football. But did he have the playmakers around him? There, you know, like there's stuff that goes into that. I feel like, you know, Quez Watkins is your number two some weeks. You're going to have inconsistent results. Now Quez is the number three. Don't forget Jalen Rager, too. And what a letdown that one has been as a, I think it was True. a pick, too. Yeah, yeah but like, like I mentioned, even when even when um, he was posting the high QBRs, he wasn't asked to do the majority of the job. It, it was the running game that was doing the work. He so, played a pretty big role in that running game, though, wouldn't you say? Well, no, yeah, yeah, with his legs, but he's a quarterback. You got to eventually, you're going to be forced to throw the football, and if you can't, then we've seen what happens with the quarterbacks that can't throw the football when asked to do so. And when the uh, defensive coordinator or head coach for the opposing team says, "No, we're going to shut what you do, what uh, what you do best down, and we're going to force you as the quarterback to beat us." No, I, I agree. I don't know. I want to ask you guys if you agree with this. I think, you know, Jalen Hurts makes his mistakes like every quarterback does. Some are worse than others. But I think that the team is so talented, the roster around him, that a lot of those mistakes are going to get, like, blown, like, under a blanket this year. Like, you're not going to see a lot of Jalen Hurts' mistakes because I think that football team is going to be winning games and it's going to be like, oh, look, Jalen's performing at, a like, a decent level to where this team can win games. And the roster around him is just so stacked that it, like it's not going to be an issue. People are not going to look back and be like, "Oh, but Jalen Hurts is throwing picks here and there, or you know, having costly turnovers." I think like it's all going to get blown under a blanket because the team around him is so good. I don't know if you guys agree with that, but I just think like he he's gonna. I think he's gonna have a good year. I really do, and I think you know his bad stuff's not going to get showed a lot of because the team's going to be winning. That's what I think. So, no, I'm definitely with that. I can see. I just look at the weapons on the outside. You guys already named them, so I'm not even going to bother. But that's enough to alleviate any of those things that, that may cast a, a negative energy upon Jalen Hurts. We may think, oh, he has one bad game. Yo, this is a guy, not to drift to fantasy, but this guy's going to be putting up crazy fantasy numbers with his legs and with his arm. And, and we echoed it already. Devontae Smith is one of the, the top receivers that came out of that draft. And he had a hell of a rookie season. It doesn't get talked about enough because of guys like Jamar Chase, but Devontae Smith is is right up there too. So couple that with A.J. Brown and, and Goddard. Jalen Hurts has, has weapons galore right now. I think the best weapons in the NFC East. Yeah, I would certainly agree. You get the I, Cowboys with a Gallup coming back from injury, and before then, with no Gallup easily, I think it's not hmm. a discussion. Actually, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think uh... – I think, yes, the Cowboys, but I also think the Commanders have a really good offensive unit with Terry, Curtis Samuel, uh, Logan Thomas at the tight end, and then you got Ant- Antonio Gibson and J.D. McKissick in the backfield. And they drafted a rookie running back, I believe, too. 
Brian Robinson from Alabama. Yeah. Real yeah, quick, so. before you jump in, I want to go over the Eagles' schedule with you guys because yeah. it is favorable to start the season. I mean, very favorable. I can see this team starting 7-0. and Detroit week one at Detroit. Who you guys yeah. got? But I, I will say for uh, – I didn't get to say this when we started covering schedules. Week one – it for me is the is the most toss up game of any game of the season because we've seen it anything can happen a, a bad team sure. can beat a good team so I can easily and we've we've talked about the Lions before and we all like the Lions we like the the uh, culture that Dan Campbell is setting in there and that they could they listen I wouldn't count the Lions out in that game okay but then you got Minnesota at home week two and it's a prime time game against Kirk Cousins. I'll take the Eagles. <laughs> I'll, take the, I'll take the Eagles too, man. Kurt doesn't usually perform in the uh, prime time, but again. So who are you I taking? Got, uh, we got to yeah. go through this or tic tac. Come on. Uh-huh. Okay, go ahead. Eagles or Eagles or Vikings? I'm asking you. I, I get, I, Vikings, okay. I would okay. have to take okay. the Vikings. Week one, I got the Lions. Week two, I'll take the Eagles. Week three, Commanders in Washington. Eagles. Eagles. Commanders. Okay. Week four, Jacksonville at home. Eagles. Eagles. Come on, stop it. I take the Eagles right now, but I got to see about the Jaguars. All right, that's fair. That's fair. Trevor has a lot of talent around him as well. Week five in Arizona. Arizona. Arizona, they're a first half team. They're only good the first. But they don't have DeAndre Hopkins the first six games. Yeah, he doesn't. He he doesn't bother me. Arizona, (laughs) Arizona. Kyler will throw it to himself. Arizona. We'll see how that goes. I think that Eagles stout defensive front can pummel Kyler if they can really Very get him point. going to the left side without D Hop. But then week six, you're playing the Cowboys at home. Sunday night football. Yes, I got the Dallas. I got the Eagles. Dallas. Okay, they're again. gonna they're gonna split. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go Cowboys. At, who's home that game? The, the Eagles. Eagles. I'm gonna say Cowboys uh road win. Yeah. yeah Cowboys usually perform better on the road. Cowboys. <laughs> so then they got their bye, and after the bye, they get the Steelers week eight at home. I, I think they absolutely destroy the Steelers. Oh. Destroy is a strong word against the Steelers. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to, just wanted I mean, to throw that out. I was going to say Steelers, but I don't know. They they changed the name to whatever from Heinz Field to whatever. They're yeah, like that. Unfortunately, they're not playing there. Oh, I absolutely hate that. The name, that but... might be their first losing season this year, Johnny T, because of that stadium name. <laughs> yeah, honestly, if there's going to be a saying... reason why, it would be. The... So, I was going to say Steelers, but I guess we're riding the, the Eagles, the Fly Eagles fly train. So I'm going to go with Philly. I had the Steelers one in that. Okay. The Steelers had the. Best defense in the division. God, they're gonna, gonna, they're they're gonna give Jalen Hurts a tough time. Huh. I can tell you that they're very good against running quarterbacks. Lamar, whatever the case may be, they're gonna neutralize him. And then week I'm, nine, I'm we got, got the Houston. With you. I've got the Steelers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Week, week nine, they're playing in Houston. Pulling. Philly, Ooh. Philly. Week ten, Commanders at their place. Philly. Monday night. Philly. I don't think they split with the Commanders this year. I think they clean clean sweep. I would agree with you. Yeah. Week 11, Colts at their place. Yeah, they're not winning that to me. Colts. Indy. I think yeah. that'll be a tough place to play this year. It's going to be a very good team this year. That's what I think. So, mm-hmm. Brim, who you got? I said Indy. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't get that. Week 12, they got Green Bay at home. Green Bay. I'm going to go with Philly. You know, I'm going to go with Philly, too. I yeah. don't know. Just something – no Devontae that year changes a lot, but I, I really do think uh, – I really do think Philly is going to turn some heads this year. Unfortunately, but I, Sunday I don't night, know. yeah. Oh, Sunday night game. I don't know. Depends what a uh, discount double check wants to do. So we'll see. <laughs> Week thirteen, they're playing Tennessee at home. I like Tennessee. Tennessee, I love uh, Mike Vrabel. Oh gosh, that's a tough. I'm going to say Tennessee too. I'm going to say. It, it, listen, it is a tough one. I don't. I don't have much expectations coming for the Titans this season. I expect them to regress, but I think they'll show glimpses of the this playoff team, that number one seed that they were just, what was it, last year? Yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the worst number one seeds. I don't know how they did that, but this is a team that's going to be fighting for a playoff spot, I think, the first week of December. So, you know what? I think I'd be with you guys in the Titans. Week 14, the playing in New York, or in New Jersey, shall I say. <laughs> <laughs> Shadow of New York. 
Uh, this is going to be a beatdown. Probably Philly. I mean, unless Jalen Hurts has one of those games last year where he throws like three picks against the Giants like he did that one game in MetLife, then that's the only way I see them beating uh, Philly. So it'd be nice to split with them, but I'm taking Philly, unfortunately. Did you guys win that game? Yes, they did. It was, Wasn't it, it was very close. It was close. I remember correctly. Listen, I watched a lot of bad games last year. That was a bad game for both teams. It was yeah. It was horrific to I, you know I, I can't get into it but yeah Phil, I'm, I'm just gonna go back I'm just gonna say Philly I think the good team overall good team Philly it, what, guys, was, what was the score of that game it you was, guys beam seven thirteen in that three interception game that was week oh. twelve yeah, yeah at your place that was late in the season yes that was yeah. late Ugh. I wonder if you wins last year. What a battle. What a battle. Yeah. What a yeah, battle. No <laughs> but can I, let me read these stats. Jalen Hurts was 14 for 31 with 129 yards, no touchdowns, three interceptions. Rushing, he rushed for 77 yards. Boston Scott carried the freight 15 for 64 and a touchdown. How did Danny Dimes do that day? I think he got, well. that's the day he hurt his neck. Well, he, he was 19 for 30, 202 yards, and a touchdown pass. They were well, so I'm awesome. sure James Bradbury is very familiar with him, though, if that's the case with three interceptions. Did he have any of those? I'm not sure. Anyways, let's move on. Week 15, they're going to pummel the, the Ch- Chicago Bears like the Bears will usually be beaten this year. I don't think we have to go into that too much. In the Bears' place. Uh, that's week 15, actually. Then week 16, they got the Cowboys. Dallas. Dallas. At home. We said, yeah, they, we said they'd split. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at their place. Week 17, Saints. Ooh. And Philadelphia. Yeah, the Saints are so tough for me. I, I don't know if I'm in on the, the Jameis Winston train. I, I really don't know. Uh, I'm going to go with the Eagles. Give me New Orleans. I, I, need to, I need to switch it up. Well, I've been saying Philly a lot, so give me New Orleans. I, I think they could be a very good team. They're solid on both sides of the ball. It's just another team that depends on uh, the quarterback and how he wants to show up after. You know, he's coming off an ACL tear, so we'll see how he does this year. Yeah, and then last game of the year, they play your Giants – uh, at home so i mean this is one of the most favorable schedules they might be resting starters by that game so i'll give, know, the, give, the, Gi- I'll give the giants uh, a w so, here. i come from a completely different boat than you guys I, I don't i don't see this as very favorable when we read through it but there's only the toughest opponents you got green bay indianapolis pittsburgh dallas and then the Cardinals without their stars here I love how he snuck Pittsburgh in there to be like one of their toughest <laughs> games. Just to, just I think the Steelers Pittsburgh. are a tougher matchup. Uh, than the I mean, okay. Well, listen. Okay, you guys talked about your number one team, all right? Now I'm going to talk about the real number one team, okay? The Dallas Cowboys, all right? Listen, I know everybody hates the Dallas Cowboys, okay? Such a joke. Uh, yeah, I, I don't – I don't I, – I don't – listen, I love, I lo- I love Dak Prescott. I loved Tony Romo before him. I loved uh, Des Bryant when he was in his prime. That man was an absolute animal. Um, when I look at Dallas this year, though, Dak is coming off um, statistically a, uh, you know, in terms of a touchdown interception ratio and completion percentage, a very good year. Uh, QBR wise, it was a 54.6, so only four points above average, which is uh, not very good. Uh, it's the worst in his career, but I think uh, Dak coming off that horrific injury can kind of explain the inconsistent quarterback play of last year. So I, I expect him this year to uh, produce at the uh, same level, but have a uh, more consistent quarterback play throughout the season. Um, Cause I think he's going to be able to trust that leg more. Uh, he's going to feel more comfortable uh, in the pocket and outside the pocket. Uh, I love his intangibles. Uh, like I said, I love his uh, uh, winning nature. He's a leader. I love his late game management and his uh, management before halftime on Mike McCarthy, too. Well, I would blame that more on Mike McCarthy. If I'm going to be we'll honest. Go, because, look, we're going to go into him. Yeah. Full yeah. Time. Because, yeah. And, and listen, I, I'll just touch on Mike McCarthy real quick. Listen, Mike McCarthy is it's not a good head coach. All right. Let's just be honest. The reason he was even a person of interest is because Aaron Rodgers made Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy is not, and and we've seen him be exposed in Dallas, this late game uh, clock management, the challenges, looking up at the big screen like, oh, should should I challenge it? Or, oh, oh, wait, I can't challenge it because I threw the challenge flag in the foot and and I messed up on that call. It's just too many mistakes from the head coach. And 
And I think we all know why he's the head coach. It's because he won't cause any problems with Jerry Jones. He's going to do what he's told, and he's going to be the puppet master like Jason Garrett. Let's call a spade a spade. That's what Jerry Jones wants. He doesn't want a, a hardball from uh, Michigan who's going to be like, no, Jerry, get out of my way. I'm a head coach. I know what I'm doing. St- You've been – you have not won a Super Bowl since the 1990s, buddy. It is 2022. Change it up. And w- and we thought we saw a little uh, a little bit of that in um, uh, I think it was twenty. What was it? When did Zach Martin get drafted? That was the Johnny Manziel draft. That was 20, 2014. 2014? Okay, yeah. that's when we thought we start to saw the change because if you remember going into that draft when they started getting closer to Dallas and Johnny Manziel was on the uh, on the board, everybody J- Jerry Jones wanted to take Johnny Manziel. That's been reported. He wanted to take J- Johnny. But Stephen Jones, his son, was able to convince him to be like, Dad, no, stop it. Basically, like slapping his hand. Dad, enough. We're taking Zach Martin, okay? And look, and it panned out perfectly. Zach Martin is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer when his career is all said and done. And, and even before that, they took um, Tyron Smith in 2011. He's been great for basically a decade plus. Uh, they drafted Travis Fedrick, who some people thought they reached for him, but they're uh, – Um, they ended up having the last laugh because he turned out to be an all pro center and one of the best in the league, if not the best, it sucks that disease uh, cut his uh, career short because he would have probably been in the hall of fame too, if he can uh, kept playing at that level. Do you want to talk about some of these teams uh, losses as well, by the way? Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm going to get to the losses. Um, and I was just about to get there. They drafted, uh, they, they stole Lyle Collins in the draft. He's gone now. Um, and they, uh, drafted, uh, Connor Williams a little bit later. He's in Miami now, so they've lost some offensive line, but they did draft in the first round this year Tyler Smith um, out of uh, – what college is he out of? Where is he from? Tulsa, I think. Tulsa. Tulsa. Okay, yeah, yeah. So Tyler – and he's going to start right away. Stephen Jones has already said that he's going to be the starting left guard coming into this season. Uh, the offensive line, if you look at it, uh, Pro Football Focus ranked Dallas's O line in 2020 27th overall. Last year they were number one. So if if Tyron Smith can stay healthy, if Tyler Smith can be a instant impact starter, which I be, I have no inkling in my mind about it being that way. If you look at what the names I just named, all those five guys that Dallas was able to uh, uh, draft and basically work up to their highest level of pot- uh, potential, why would they not be able to do the same thing with Tyler Smith? So. Um, I believe, I believe in Dak Prescott. Now, I will say Ezekiel Elliott has not been Ezekiel Elliott since 2019. Since he signed that six-year extension with $50 million guaranteed, which is a horrible deal. It was a horrible deal then. It's a horrible deal now. Um, and he's splitting time with uh, uh, Pollard in the backfield. So Zeke needs to return to his old form. I, I, I 100% agree with that. Or he's going to be cut or he's going to be traded. Because I don't see Jerry Jones dealing with this much more. I mean, we just saw what they did with Amari Cooper. They had to pay him all that money to keep him away from Washington. He didn't live up to the contract because it was almost impossible to live up to that type of contract. But don't you and, think? Go ahead. Don't you think Zeke's more like Amari Cooper is one of the most inconsistent number one receivers in the NFL? I look at Zeke yeah. Elliott and what he provides as a pass blocker, a pass catcher, and also a runner in between the tackles, that's kind of what allows Tony Pollard to be that, you know, that complimentary piece that's going to come in. He's going to change the pace. And that one-two punch makes him one of the best backfields in the NFL, even if yeah, Zeke. But when you're paying Zeke all that money and he's not producing at the level that he should be, that his price tag is, it's not okay. But it's lo- really not. I understand where you're coming from. He's not to the back here, 2,000 yards the way he was in 2018. But last season, he still gave him almost 1,300 yards. And he's one of the best blocking backs in the NFL. And like I said before, I mean, sure, he's probably not going to return to that form. It's highly unlikely given the fact that he's getting older. But he still just he just turned 27 last week. And I think this is a top 20 back. We're about to talk about some of the other backs in this division. I would much rather him over... The guy the Giants have paid. Yeah, but because John, of what you just can... said top twenty back, and you're giving him a six year contract with fifty million guaranteed. You you don't say top twenty, you say top ten when you're given that kind of money. And Brandon's one hundred percent right. And with that with that amount of money that you're spending on him for somebody that hasn't been 
this elite back since 2019, it, I, I've said it before on this podcast. I think running back is the most replaceable position in football. I, I and, a long shot. Yeah, and and last season, I don't think it's much of a debate, but in that running back room, Tony Pollard last season was the better running back. So they're paying him this much money for his backup to run for 300 yards less than him? And, and Justin, Pollard. just to jump off that, John, you said he only had 1,002 yards this last season. His he only rushed for over 100 yards twice. Back I'm to talking about games. total yards. Yeah, total yards. Oh, oh, total yards. Okay. Yeah. But I was looking at just rushing. I mean, two back to back games, 143 rushing yards and 110. And then nothing, nothing else over 100 yards that entire season. When you're only doing that twice, that that's not good. And, and uh, last point, I'll let JQ jump on um, his uh, homeboy Dallas Cowboys. Um, CD Lamb. He's got a lot. He's got massive shoes to fill. I think we can all agree with wearing that number 88 and what it, that number means in Dallas Cowboy history with Michael Irvin and Des Bryant wearing those numbers. He needs to jump to it. He needs to be a, a true top 10 receiver and a true number one wide receiver this year. Amari Cooper's gone now. You're the guy. Michael Gallup's coming off a torn ACL. You're the guy now. You need to make a jump. You were drafted in a class just to name the top ones, uh, Justin Jefferson, Henry Ruggs, Brandon Ayuk, Jerry Judy, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, uh, Chase Claypool, Johnny's guy, and Gabriel Davis, who had that insane 201-yard, four-touchdown playoff record uh, game for the Buffalo Bills. So it's time for CD to be the number one. I expect I expect 1,500-plus yards, 100-plus receptions, and 10-plus touchdowns. You need to produce this year, buddy. It's time. That's facts. I think that whole – everything you just said was facts. But I, if I'm a team game planning against Dallas, I'm double-teaming C.D. Lamb all day, and I'm going to make them run the ball. I mean, Pollard's great, don't get me wrong, but like you guys were saying, they paid Zeke this money to be good. Like, you know, his whole contract. Even Jerry Jones – I saw a tweet about the other day, like re re reportedly, that Jerry Jones wants them to use Zeke more. Like, they want him to be the workforce of this offense still like they still think they have that guy in them deep down and granted he's battled injuries too like the mcl sprain he had last year you know it's tough he didn't look the same the guy plays through a lot like i respect him a lot i was a big fan of him when he was at ohio state and of course he gets drafted by the team i hate the most so then i'm like of course i can't really root for this guy um but you know three names that jump out to me that they lost is amari cooper like we said traded to the browns randy gregory signed with the broncos Cedric Wilson is with the Dolphins and also too Connor Williams is signing with the Dolphins as well. One of their offensive guards, they lost a couple of those key pieces on the offensive line this year. That's why they dropped so far in the rankings. And I, I think that's really going to hit home for them and be like, wow, like this is like, we we've been used to 10 plus years of great offensive line play. Like this is going to be the first year where they really struggle. And, you know, I hate to say it. I'm kind of very excited to see it um, because it, it's finally payback now. They get to feel what I've felt the past couple of years of my life when my quarterback says hike and, and there's three guys in his face immediately. So, but I think they'll be a good team still. Don't get me wrong, but I think they're going to have their ups and downs. And this is the, the first year everyone's going to be like, wow, like this team isn't all that. I mean, granted, they make it to the playoffs and then they lose to the 49ers, which I, I predicted I saw that coming. But I, I still think good team overall, but they're going to, their weak points are gonna they're gonna shine this year. You're really gonna see them. They're gonna they're gonna poke through. They've lost many key pieces. I feel like Demonte Casey and Keanu Neal in the back end as well. So I feel like well in the draft they go and get Jalen Tobert out of South Alabama. He's a, a bigger receiver could take the top over a defense. This is gonna be a developmental year. We're gonna bring in these new pieces to the draft, and these guys are gonna have to be able to step in and play legitimate snaps as first year players. And I think for a Cowboy team when. You speak of Mike McCarthy, will he be here past the season? I would expect him not to be, but it's the Cowboys, so you literally don't know no, what the intention no, John, is. John, John, he, he's going to be here for the long haul because of what I said. He, he's the perfect puppet for Jerry Jones. Jerry doesn't want somebody causing trouble, and he's the guy for it. I, I hate it, too. I, I think, um, and I heard, um, I, like, I, I listened to uh, Undisputed a lot in first take, but Skip Bayless was this uh, huge Cowboys fan. Uh, he wanted Dan Quinn to take over as the head coach. Uh, How about Sean he, Payne? He talks about, huh? Sean Payne, I feel like, is the obvious well, option. So, yeah, obviously, yeah, but um, th that 
Yeah, uh, we can't talk about Sean Payton right now because he's a uh, retired and he's still got. I'm pretty sure he's still got a contract with New Orleans. So whatever, but that would be you know perfect you know perfect world Sean Payton. But uh, Dan Quinn, the, the game I forget which game he took over uh, as the um, uh, interim head coach for the uh, Cowboys this year because I think Mike McCarthy had COVID. And Skip talks about how that that was the first time all year that he saw the energy on the Cowboys bench, like the team was actually you know, ramped up and ready to play. And Dan Quinn, you know, he got that team ready. So um, you don't see that from Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy's not a motivator. He's not even really an X's and O's guy. I, he's just there, he's there to be honest. I'm sorry. He's really just there. And, and it's just, <laughs> it, it, it's embarrassing. Like, it's like Jerry wants to control everything on his team. And it's so hard because nobody can really tell him, yo, you are, you have been losers for the past, how many years, 20 years plus you've been losers. It's time to change it up. Not a lot of playoff ones. So. And, and just to uh, uh, what JQ said about, like I said, I think that first round pick out of Tulsa, Tyler Smith is going to come in and be an instant starter for them and be an impact player. Um, and he said, you guys talked about, they lost Randy Gregory, but they brought in Dante Fowler to replace him. And they drafted in the second round, Sam Williams, uh, who's uh, had some trouble in college, but that's a Jerry Jones special. He likes to take out uh, trouble players and uh, it's worked out for him in the past. They still got Demarcus uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, Trayvon Diggs in the uh, secondary with uh, Jordan Lewis, who I love. Now Trayvon Diggs, the interceptions will fool you because I'm pretty sure he gave up the most yards by any cornerback in the league last year. The double moves, he's susceptible to that because he gets greedy for those interceptions. And, and I was just watching a little mini movie of Mac Jones' rookie season last year, and uh, one of the highlight plays was against the Cowboys where Kendrick Bourne hit him with a double move, and it was a 75-yard touchdown um, down the field, which I think was the longest play for New England that year. But Tra I, th I give Trayvon Diggs a benefit of the doubt because he's only been a cornerback for five years. And to see him at the level he is right now, only five years in, I think, and he's only 23, I think, I think he's going to take those jumps and start not getting fooled as much in those situations. So, and you talk about Keanu Neal missing. I mean, they got Malik Hooker still. So I, I just, I look at Dallas and I still say this is Dallas's division to lose. And I, I don't see anybody uh, dethroning them this year because I think they have, like I always say, it's a quarterback's league. They got the best quarterback. They're going to win the division. So I got a question for you guys. Uh, we're going we're gonna to rewind. Do any of you guys remember what 2016 was like for the Cowboys? Ryan for game. Who? Dax ran it up. Yeah. Short yardage. Oh, for the Cowboys? Yeah. 2016? Won 13 games, right? 13 and three, lost in the divisional round to Green Bay on uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was Dax's rookie year. Yeah, correct. The rookie year of both Zeke and Dak. After that year, I feel like everybody thought that the Cowboys at some point, didn't you guys think by 2016 to now that they might have had a championship after what we saw from those two? No, because Jason Garrett was the coach and now it's Michael yeah. McCarthy. Yeah. Hmm. Truth be told. That, that, that's the biggest blunt. And Jerry Jones still owns the team. And he's going it, to, it's, it, I'm sorry to bring it up. And I know JQ is a, a Knicks fan too, but it's just like James Dolan in the NBA. <laughs> it, it, that you're, you're, oh, when, when the, guess what? What's the old saying? The fish rots from the head down. And when the head is rotten, the whole team's going to be rotten. And it's really hard to overcome that. So then my question, what I was going to get into was, is there even a championship window for the Cowboys? Do you the, guys good, see it? the good news is Jerry Jones doesn't do the draft picks. And this is one of the best teams that draft in the NFL. So I think there mm -hmm. is a window at this team. You talk about CeeDee Lamb. You still have the Zach Martins. This team is stacked. I just think they lost some key pieces. I'm looking at the head coach. I feel like that's the biggest deterrent with the squad because if you put Sean Payne here right now, oh, yeah. they have a yeah. championship they're, window. They're, they're Super Bowl contenders. Easily. They have Sean Payne, they're Super Bowl contenders. Yeah, they have one of the better no quarterbacks in the NFL, no doubt about it. Dak is a good QB. And, Brian, you talked about, you know, you have the best quarterback in the division. Sure, they had a better quarterback in, in the 49ers game. And look what happened. That doesn't always matter. Sometimes a better football team is going to beat the better quarterback. Even still, you talk about the running game, the O-line, I think it's still going to be one of the better ones, one of the best. 
The defense still has playmakers on it. I think Micah Parsons, we haven't even mentioned, have we? Yeah. I think he's a dark horse to win defensive player of the year this season. I think with Dan Quinn, the job he did as a rookie, Micah is a stud. He is the best player on this team, I think. We're going to be saying that by the end of the season. And I think with the playmakers all around the squad, yeah, they got a championship window. I just think ultimately, with Mike McCarthy, that is not open. But without him, I think that thing can certainly, you know, pry free. That's just my take. I'll be honest. I don't think Dak Prescott could win big games against a big team. Thank you. I, I, I see. Uh, look at the NFC. You got Tom Brady still. You still got the Rams. And guess what? They see the Rams and the Bucks in the first five weeks. That'll be, that'll be proof for you guys right there in week one when they get schlacked by Tom Brady in their home stadium. We're going to be like, oh, man, this Dallas yeah, but, season. Yeah, but I bet you would have thought that last year that they were going to get shellacked with Dak Prescott coming off the injury, and it was a really close game where Dak had a chance to win it. You're right, but guess what? They didn't win. I yeah, but they did it because they, Dak was coming off a win the game. compound fracture. The bone was through his skin. That wasn't I, I think I think Dak they could have played again middle. in week 15, and I would still have taken the bucks. Yeah, but I still think that Dak, we got to give Dak – a little bit of a pass for last year because of the injury that he had. I think no this year, it. yeah, I think this year he's gonna he's gonna show you. I, I listen, when you're a fourth round pick and you come out the gate in the preseason slanging and banging and beat Tony Romo for the job. Well, I, Tony Romo got injured, but even when he got healthy, they stuck with Dak because Dak was playing unbelievably. Like Justin said, thirteen and three made it to the divisional round of the playoffs against the Packers. I think they were one Mason crossbar kick away from winning that game. I mean, he made two insanely, insanely hard kicks in that game. Like, like the, the, the last one I believe was the one that was like looking like it was going left and then it freaking curved right at the last second. Uh, and that was the game. I think Aaron Rodgers made that unbelievable throw to um, uh, I think it was Jared Cook Jr. Maybe the tight end on the sideline. I believe that was that game. So, listen, when you go toe-to-toe with Aaron Rodgers in your rookie season and you're one play away from winning it and you're a fourth-round pick, you come from, you know, some people not expecting much, he's he's an overachiever to the highest order. You're right, but this I, team I hasn't even made a conference championship. They've played in the divisional round. Yeah, but they haven't gotten like, by. They can't Justin, get through. I look at Justin, Green Bay. Look at Tampa. Look at, Justin, look at L.A. Just yeah. thank you. Wait, wait, wait. Arizona Stop on LA. Play in Texas. Stop on Tyler LA. Stop Texas. on LA because I got you. Better than them. I San got Francisco you. is better than them. That's five teams that Justin, I think can walk into Dallas, and Dallas doesn't stand a chance. They oh, look yeah, good I, for three quarters, and then they'll flop in the fourth. I'm not buying Dallas this year at all. I'm never buying Dallas. I'm not Man. getting on that hype. Yeah. <laughs> all right, hold on, Justin. Hold on. I got you though. I got you. Look at LA, right? We always talk about Matthew Stafford and how he was in Detroit with Jim Schwartz and Coach Pencil. <laughs> okay? Let's be honest. If Dak Prescott – tell me right now, if that 2016 <laughs> Dallas Cowboys team had Sean Payton instead of Jason Garrett, are the odds better that they beat that Green Bay team and make it to a Super Bowl? Okay, the odds are better. But the thing is, I, I'm not even going to say anything about – I'm not going to bash Jason Garrett or anything because that game, they didn't lose because of their head coach. They lost because Aaron Rodgers threw a, a, probably one of the greatest throws we've ever seen down the sideline to Jared Cook. That's why they lost the game. Yeah, but it, you you so, right, so then look over the last look over the last six years. Look over the last six years. If Sean Payton's the head coach, do they have a better odds of being a championship team? Sure. You I'd gotta say. look. The coach is holding them back. When you have Jason Garrett, who's a average coach at best. And Mike McCarthy, who's probably an average coach at best. I'm sorry, man, but it, it's freaking it's hard to overcome that. Well, guess what? They still got an average average coach on the sideline. Nothing's gonna they change. Do. They do. Dallas is gonna be Dallas. I'll, Dallas I'll say it. I'll say this. I think the championship window is closed, and I think 2016 those those couple of years after that were the years to do. I just don't think the roster is the same. I think Dak's a good quarterback, but look at that game against San Francisco last year. They were home. They had a home playoff game, and they absolutely blew it. They blew it. They played terrible the first three quarters, and they're down like two scores, three scores, and then Dak starts his, oh, his big comebacks, they always call it, and then they're like, oh, look at all of his stats. Look how he does. 
it's because he's throwing the ball 40, 50 times a game when they're always down like two scores. So, and San Francisco took it to him that game. I had a feeling San Francisco was going to win. And I thought they were the better team. I honestly think, I really think I, you could take Jimmy G over Dak Prescott in some situations and I'd be totally fine with it. Look, look what, look at the experience and look who's been a winner in the past. Jimmy G knows how to get it done. He's been to a Super Bowl, and he was just a couple plays short this year of making it again. I just think their their window has closed, but I think they're a good team. I know we, we, if we're going through the schedule, I'd love to. I think their ceiling's ten wins. I really do this year. I think that's one it. thing. Before Time we out. Get- Can we have JQ on every damn episode? <laughs> <laughs> one thing. One thing before you get into the schedule, JQ. Does Dak Prescott miss that throw that Jimmy G missed in the Super Bowl? Too many Sanders. You know, no, I don't, doesn't. you know, I don't think so. I, I you know, cause I, cause like, I, I get it. Like Dak's a, he's a great quarterback. He's got a good arm. Like he makes those good throws, but you know, I've seen his flaws and they're, and they're pretty bad, but I don't know. Like Jimmy G should have made that throw. I really think about it. You know, I, I, I don't know what you guys think, but I thought that was a makeable throw. And I was like, it's a, it's a freaking, it's a, it's, 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 it's tough to look at it because, like, you saw the separation he had on the two guys, and it's, like, over the top, and it's, like, you you're blow- an NFL, You're an NFL quarterback. Yeah. You're playing at the highest level. You're getting paid millions of dollars. You make that throw. Very true, Brandon. Very true. I just if think – I don't know, if, man. That, that if, you want, if you want to go into the schedule, John, if you want to do that, we can. Because, like uh, JQ said, they have uh, two t- – or Justin, whichever one uh, said, they have two – Insanely tough games starting out the season. Mm-hmm. They have three tough games to start the season. Actually, I'm looking at. Yeah. Right now. I mean, last year was the same thing. They played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the defending champs, week one. They listen. They played them. Almost. They almost beat them. The schedule after that though gets pretty easy. Sure, you get Tampa Bay and the Bengals the first two weeks of the season, but then you get the Giants, Commanders, Rams, and Eagles are two tough ones. But it really does slowing up after that. We, but, but we haven't even touched on the commanders. I think they might give – they might they, – they won't be slouches. All right, we'll, we'll jump into the commanders in a second. After that Detroit game following the Eagles and the Rams and the commanders, you got the Bears at Green Bay, at Minnesota, Giants, Colts, Houston, Jacksonville, Philadelphia, Tennessee, and the commanders. I think the ceiling for this team is 12 wins. I don't think it's 10 because I can easily see them being Indianapolis at third place. The same exact thing goes for Philadelphia. They can beat Philadelphia both times, though I think they're going to split. And then with the Packers, I wouldn't be surprised if Dak goes into the Blambo and beats them. I can definitely see that. I think it just depends what team shows up every week in and out. You guys know how football works in all sports. Whatever team comes out and plays harder is going to win that day. You know, you look at some of these teams like Detroit. I mean, they, they've kind of been turning some heads. I'm not saying they're a playoff team, but they – they compete. They battle hard. That's a hard fighting team. I could, you know, you never know. What if they come out and play harder than Dallas that day? Um, Chicago, forget Chicago. They're just, you know, bad, bad. Like maybe that Minnesota game. Maybe Minnesota can sneak one out against Dallas. I don't know. I think, I think that first. There, isn't there, oh, just a, could you, isn't there a stat? Is it, is it Kirk Cousins hasn't beaten the Cowboys or Kirk Cousins continues to beat the Cowboys over? And, which one is it? I feel like he's winless or he's undefeated against them. I don't know. I forget. I forget because I hear Skip Bayless talk about all the time. I, I think Kirk he's Cousins two and eight versus the Cowboys in this career. Two and eight, yeah. So Kirk Cousins struggles against those Dallas Cowboys a lot. So we might have to change that. Um, yeah. But those just those first couple of games are tough. Obviously, Tampa Bay, Bengals. Listen, I know the Giants aren't the greatest team, but a division game on a on a Monday night, I think that you know, let's know like walk in the park. I think they're favored the- against the Bengals by two two and a half right now. Okay, that, that's interesting to see. You know, they got two division games back to back. I just always think division games, no matter how bad the teams yeah. are, I, I think they're a toss up at the end of the day. Then they play the Rams and the Eagles. Like, I think those first six weeks, it, it's, it's going to be tough for them. But I think I could see it. Like, Johnny T, if they come out and play really well, I could see the 12 wins. But I'm still, my ceiling's still at 10 for them. With the Cowboys and last year, right? When they start off the season, I mean, you look at Dak Prescott, he put up really solid numbers to start the season and to end the season. Not not the playoff game. He played terribly. There's no excuse for that. Um, but in the last three games of the season against Washington, Arizona, and Philly, he went, uh, let's see, uh, seven, um, 12 touchdowns, no interceptions. He posted um, a 72% completion percentage, 63, and then a 78, all back-to-back, and a 71 71- QBR, 61 QBR, and a 98 QBR. 
So I, I think that's more indicative of where Dak Prescott is going to kick off the season this year is he's going to start the season off better. Cause he, like I said, he started off the seasons pretty well. So I Just think, for- I think those, those first six weeks, yes, they're tough, but I think it's going to battle test Dallas and it's going to help them out in the long run later in the season and into the postseason, where they're going to, uh, have faced the highest level of competition and we're going to be able to see where Dallas is at early on this season. Just remember that offensive line isn't the same. So that's going to be, that's going to be a key for them this year to see how they do with not a dominant offensive line, but good quarterback. He is a very good quarterback. He could, he can make the throws. I know he can. So. It's going to be a very long season for the Dallas Cowboys and their fans. And I'm looking forward to tuning into first take to seeing Stephen A. Smith laugh because it's coming. No, those are hilarious. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Um, but let, let's, let's jump into a team that we haven't mentioned yet, who uh, I actually might shock you guys. I have coming in second place in the division. And that's the Washington Commanders. No, JQ, not the Giants. The Washington Commanders. Now, this is similar to uh, another team we uh, previewed uh, a couple weeks ago. I, I forget it off the top of my head. But when, when you asked, I said, when you asked me about that team, I would say, oh, they're not that very good of a team. But when I actually looked at it and did the research, I, I saw that I actually really liked the team. And that's the same thing with the Commanders. If you asked me before I even looked at them, I would say, ah, they're probably going to be in third place in the division. But then I look at the team and I say, you know what? And listen, I, I know I know it might come back to bite me in the ass, trusting Carson Wentz. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna trust Carson Wentz. And John, John's already shaking his head, like, don't fall for the trap again. But and listen, I know it was a disappointing year in Indy, right? He did – I forget the numbers. of. I think it was 27 touchdowns to seven interceptions. Correct. I know those numbers. With seven numbers, fumbles lost in there too? Yeah, yeah exa- I was just about to say those numbers do lie because if you look at the whole picture – like in a vacuum, they're all right, but when you look at the whole picture, it's it wasn't that good. Right? A, a disappointing. He did post over a 90 uh, passer rating for the fourth time in his career. He'll be playing with the best wide receiver he's ever had in his career in Terry McLaurin. McLaurin, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> the O line is 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 going through some changes. I will admit, uh, uh, Brandon Sh- uh, Schreff is uh, the All Pro is gone, and they lost uh, Eric Flowers. Uh, JQ might know him, uh, but they did <laughs> they did bring in uh, an All Pro in uh, Andrew Norwell and a five time Pro Bowler who we've talked about in Trey Turner from. Uh, um, He's solid. Was- he was yeah, pretty solid last year. He was with right Carolina for the, for the longest time, but I think, he, yeah, he played for the Steelers and another mm-hmm. team, I think, too. Um, Chargers. Yeah. So so the O-line's going through some changes, but they brought in guys to uh, plug in and, and fill that role. I mentioned before um, the receiving core um, with Terry and Curtis Samuel, and I think there's – um. Jahan Dotson. They, dra- they just dra- they drafted a, a number one wide receiver, right, in the first round. Jahan is yeah. awesome. Can I touch on him for a second? Go ahead, look at t- what t- Carson t- Wentz was able to do last year, Michael Pittman, his second season. They then go out in the first round and say, we're going with Dotson. He's a bigger route runner that can run it very well. He can take the top over defense. We're talking about Jalen Tolbert before. I think this is a guy who, in terms of a vertical threat, Carson has that. In terms of Curtis Samuel, who can be their Diadebo, and I mean real Diadebo, he wasn't really available from last year, you have that. Terry McLaurin, I think, if he's not top 10 receiver, is right there on the cusp, and the only reason why he hasn't proven or actually inserted himself into that mix is because he hasn't even had mediocre quarterback play. Sure, he's had some moments, a Heineke or what have you, but I think Wentz, is he mediocre? I would put him around the 16 to 21 tier with Baker, Tannehill, he's and all those He's an average folks. quarterback. I would say, yeah, his his floor is well below average. His ceiling, we saw the MVP season, that's not coming back. Wentz is just a different quarterback now. His ability to improvise and stay collected, the composure, I think, has really just disappeared. I think it's a mental thing more than anything else. I think some of the athleticism of the torn ACL is not there anymore. You're not going to see him, kind of like Andrew Luck or maybe Josh Allen trying to make big-time plays where he's risking his body. I feel like there is a hurdle now in his mind and I don't know if he's ever going to be able to actually, you know, overcome that. And that is really the limiting factor with this this commander's team. I worry about Carson Wentz's ability to lead 
and kind of, you know, put the flag in the sand and say, let's go follow me. I don't think he can do that. So, just, uh, and, and I, I hear your points loud and clear, trust me, okay? Because I still have the same uh, reservations with Carson Wentz. But him, I believe in more so than the other quarterbacks that I've said where I've said I like the team, but I don't believe in the quarterback. He's the one that I say I believe in him more than those guys, especially with the talent around. I mean, Antonio Gibson, who's a dual threat out of the backfield, who's becoming a rising star in the NFL. J.D. McKissick is a very good receiving back. They drafted Brian Robinson Jr. in the third round from Alabama. We've seen the Alabama running backs and how they um, are able to uh, transition to the next level in the uh, NFL. Uh, we touched on the receiving core. Uh, Logan Thomas is on the uh, pup list, but uh, I expect him to be able to play this season. And he was able, he was a breakout uh, tight end last year. Uh, defensively, they have, uh, they got, let's see, what is it? Speaking uh, of the pup list. Yeah, pup list, right? Uh, they got three, I believe it's three first rounders on the D line, or no, four first rounders on the D line. So they got uh, Darren Payne, who they took in 2018, 13th overall, Jonathan Allen who they took in 2017, uh, 17th overall. And then they got uh, Montez Sweat and uh, the, the, the guy of that defensive line in Chase Young, who was the second overall pick. Now he is coming off a torn ACL that uh, ended his uh, uh, second, uh, sophomore season last year, and he's going to miss uh, the start of the season this year. But when he comes back, we're going to have to see that, um, that defensive line of um, – 20 uh 2020 where um if you look at it that's right here which is just it's just insane. so the d line in 2020 they were uh sixth in sacks last uh in 2020 and then in 2021 they dropped 17th and that that heavily impacted the secondary because in 2020 they they were number two in the NFL in, in passing touchdowns allowed with 21 last year they were dead last and they allowed 34 passing touchdowns so that D line needs to get the pressure because we I just showed you the numbers if they don't that's going to impact the secondary I have faith in that D line um, to get it done they still have some talent in the uh, in the backfield uh, they got a, a um, uh, a first round pick last year they took Jamin Davis out of Kentucky to play in linebacker in secondary they got uh, Kendall Fuller um, they signed uh, last year William Jackson the third from Cincy uh, they got Bobby McCain who they re-signed to a two year deal last year he picked off uh, two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL and Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady uh, and, and just to wrap up the Washington th this is one of my main points because I don't think it's an argument who the best head coach is in this division. I would hope not. It's it's Ron Rivera, Riverboat Ron. Nick Sirianni might have a say uh, about that, my man. We need to see one more year of Sirianni, I think. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, Riverboat Ron. Riverboat Ron is that guy. And the, the things that he's overcome in his in, in, in just his life in general with having cancer is, is admirable. And um, so thankful that he's uh, still around with us and he's able to do what he loves. Uh, so I, I believe in Riverboat Ron. Uh, I think he's going to cultivate this team. And unlike uh, Mike McCarthy, he is a great motivator. So uh, I believe in Riverboat Ron. I think they, they are going to give the uh, Cowboys the toughest uh, test this year. But like I said, to start this thing off, I do think the Eagles, Washington, and Dallas are going to be close throughout this whole season. Speaking of the defensive line, they had another top draft pick in the second round out of Alabama and Federi and Mathis. Uh, to add to that defensive line. And there's just so much talent there. I think it's great, just like it was last season. The worry, once again, is the offense supporting the defense. That big win they had in 2020 against my Steelers, the way the Steelers fell apart that season with an awesome defense like this on paper was an offense that couldn't run the ball consistently, a questionable offensive line, a limited quarterback. It wasn't consistent whatsoever. Those three things all impacted the defense negatively because they were kind of left stranded out there. And that was why last year... The commanders had, or the football team had issues when that was a team name. And of course, players were going down. Logan Thomas had a breakout year in 2020. He was out last season. I think getting him back is also, along with a healthy Curtis Samuel, a big time difference maker. But in the end, do you trust this offense to move the chains and be reliable so they could actually 
finish or place above Philadelphia? I doubt so. I nope. trust Jalen Hurts more than Carson Wentz, and while they're in the same tier now, I'm taking Hurts any day, man. I trust him way more to lead. And more importantly, I trust that Eagles offense way more to move the chains to that defensive line than I do this Redskin Commanders football team. My apologies. I didn't do that oh. on purpose. Oh. Listen, I, 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 I'm, I look at the, the Commanders right now, and I'm with you 100% where there's questions on the offensive side of the ball. But for me, it's all from the quarterback. Uh, I'm, I was a fan of Carson Wentz. One, he was in, he was on my fantasy team for a while. Don't ask me why I held on to him. He wasn't wow. blowing the world off, but I had him. So he was there. And I remember games last season. This, this is, is my biggest concern where he would literally throw the ball away. That, that, that'd be it. He'd give the game to the other team. I, it stands out to me that they, they had a, a game against the Titans that went into OT and he literally threw the game away. And then, to end the season, all he needed was to win one. They went, they, they, they went to Vegas. They lost 23 to 20. He didn't put the team on his back. You didn't see that, that anchor that's supposed to be behind center for you at quarterback. And then and on the last week of the season, you had probably the greatest matchup to get your team in, and you lose to the Jaguars. Have you heard about that stat, Justin? What? They haven't. The Colts haven't beaten the Jaguars in Jacksonville. I think the last, it's it's either like the last five or six seasons. And I saw it like that tweet going into that week, and I was like, oh, I was like, they're doomed. They're doomed. So like that, like it's kind of cool how like crazy stat lines come up like that. Wow. But like you were saying, I just wanted to build off. You have you got to win one game against a team that hasn't won many all year, and you can't get that job done. That 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 sticks in my mind, and like that stuff, like you said, you like you'll remember that and be like, well. <laughs> Oh, yeah, wouldn't. the last time the Colts went in Jacksonville was 2014 with Andrew yeah. Luck. Wow. Yeah. yeah, no, they they had some losses on their schedule. I'm looking at it right now. They had uh, some bad losses, right, Justin? What happened? They had some bad losses, right, the Colts last year? Yeah, ugly ones. I remember, I think it was a Monday night against Baltimore, a Monday or a Sunday night against Baltimore, and they had a two-score lead on those guys going into the second half, and boom, I had, I had some money on that. And that's, that's how I really remember it. But – Oh, so, you lost, so you lost money that night. Yes, I lost money that night. So, unfortunate, unfortunate. <laughs> but Baltimore, they they had the, they had the game in the bag, and Baltimore came charging back. Uh, like I mentioned, I already mentioned the Vegas one. I mentioned the Jaguars one. Uh, they almost coughed up the game against New England when they were up. Like, sorry, did you get no. What happened? Keep in mind through all of this, Carson has one of the very best offensive lines in football. I know Quinn Nelson wasn't one hundred percent last year, but that Colts offensive line. You look on paper is stacked yeah. and you have one of the best running games, which is better than the one that the commanders have. And in spite of that, he struggled there. He couldn't be consistent. Like you said, he was horrible. If I, uh, if my memory serves in that Patriots game, right. Yeah. And you think he's going to do a better job with the commanders. I know he's got Terry McLaurin, who's awesome. And there's some surrounding talent, like a touch on Jahan Dotson can burn you from all three levels. But the offensive line, the running game, those things, you know, that's that's a big concern because you're not going to have that the way you do with the Colts. And most importantly, I mean, I like Riverboat Ron, very good coach. But in Indianapolis, he had one of the best coaches in Frank Reich as well. So, I mean, he's going to a, a big-time downgrade here in the commanders, no, no matter how you want to put it. Yeah. All right. Because you know what? When he snaps the ball and he goes to hand that football off, Jonathan Taylor isn't going to be there for him. <laughs> you, they – the Washington needs him to step up. He's not going to be able to hand the ball off 25, 30 times a game and expect this bell cow of a running back to go over. Antonio Gibson's not Jonathan Taylor. Will this team lead the league in Pro Bowls, you think? Yeah. Yes. No. Well, they'll have a couple. I think Terry will be one. Chase, if Chase is going to miss at least the first week, I think he missed the first four, probably not. I mean, yeah, I mean, he had that injury late in the season, I think, too. I think it was after, like, the halfway point of the season, I think it happened. And unfortunately, I hate seeing players get hurt. And a guy like him that I was begging to be a New York Giant a couple of years ago, unfortunately, wasn't meant to be. Um, but, yeah, I, I like to see him play. So, when he's in, he's a he's definitely a very talented guy. So, th that that's going to that's gonna hurt them when he's not playing for them. So, um, I mean, really, like, you guys, like, Brandon, you were saying you think they're going to finish, like, top tier in the division, like, you know, like, fighting with, like, Philly and Dallas. To be honest with you, I think I think they're going to be in dead last. I really, like oh, Justin was saying, you're putting, all, you're putting a lot of pressure on Carson Wentz. There's no Jonathan Taylor. 
I know he's got good weapons, like Curtis Samuel. I I was like, like when they signed him last year, I was like, oh, this is gonna be interesting. Like he can be a good player for this team. Never saw him. Might have played a, a game or two because he got injuries and battled COVID, whatever. But I don't know this 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 team is relying on Carson Wentz. This isn't like like I was saying. There's no Jonathan Taylor. There's no you know that's the base baby. Then that's it. <laughs> I'm gonna say this. Their defense is good, but Brandon even highlighted it too. They got torched last year, and they were like first in like touchdowns course, given up or yards allowed. So it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. I mean, can they flip it 180 and be very good? They can, yeah. But I don't know. I don't see it, and that's not just me being like a, a biased Giants fan. I want to let you guys know. That. I just think they're not gonna be a good team this year. I don't think they're gonna be like dead last in like the NFL, but I think I think they're winning like six games, five games. I think so. I don't know. I just, it, it's going to be tough. They, it's going to be tough. Let me say something real quick before we go to your Giants. When I look at this commander's organization, I just say to myself, there's no direction here. And as Brian talked about earlier with Jerry Jones, the worst owner in pro sports perhaps is in Washington and it starts from the top all the way down. I think Ron Rivera's done a very good job given the circumstances and the position he's been placed in. But I just don't see the long-term growth with this team. They take Sam Howell in the fifth round. I thought that was a great value pick for a player that was expected to go in day one last September. Mm-hmm. But I'm really concerned in three years, when we look back at the commanders as, a, as an organization, are they going to be in the same exact position, just churning this quarterback wheel again and again? A few years ago, the quarterback was Alex Smith, and he has the worst injury I've seen in my life. He was for them the guy bringing them to the playoffs. He he marked stability, and they're six and three with him. Then you're going through Kyle Allen, Taylor Heineke, Ryan Fitzpatrick got hurt first year, the first season, first game of the season last year. Now we're on Carson Wentz, and if this Carson Wentz project fails, which I fully expect it to, maybe it'll be exciting. Maybe probably will be kind of sad as well for a former number two overall pick. There is no direction here, quite frankly. I see an organization that is spinning through chaos. Rest in peace to Dwayne Haskins as well. That was the quarterback of the franchise took, and he wasn't ready immediately. Case Keenum was the other guy. There's just no stability, quite frankly. Like I said before, I think Ron Rivera is a good coach, but I don't think he's going to be one to overcome, just generally speaking, the fact they don't have a quarterback long-term. And the the actual front office, the, the ability to get the most out of your defensive talent, they had an awesome defense on paper last year, but because of COVID, because of injuries and what have you, the defense was terrible. And long term, I just think this this commander's team is going to make no progress in the next few seasons. And really, I don't see a whole lot to look forward to outside Terry McLaurin catching touchdown passes and Chase Young hopefully being healthy with Jonathan Allen. And ideally, he'll get some development from Jahan Dotson throughout his career. That's really all I see here. Uh, 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 I like that, Johnny. Too. That was from the heart, that one. I like that. Yeah. No, I, listen, that all, your guys is, all your guys' points are 100% valid, and I can't argue them. Uh, and, and like I said, just to kick off the Washington, uh, um, uh, my, uh, my piece on them, I said, listen, this could come back to bite me in the ass, putting my faith in Carson Wentz. But listen, I, 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 I'm going to. And if it does, <laughs> I'll be the first one to say, listen, I was 100% wrong. You guys were 100% right. And. He's, he's not the guy. He's not. He, he's just a guy, as they like to say. He's got to be the guy for that team, though. Yeah. Just, yeah. So. So let's let's uh, let's go a little uh, New York time. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> let's do it. I'm ready. I'm excited to hear what you guys have to say because it it a lot of a lot has changed. There's been a lot of moving around of that team since uh, I last saw you guys. Well, obviously, you know. Last year, I'm speaking out of my behind at uh, Connecticut School Broadcast and saying playoffs, this and that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't think they were going to be that terrible. Um, you know, because I, I always have like a lot of faith in them. You know, it's my favorite team to root for. So you always got to back up your boys. You always got to support them. I know you guys know that too. Um, when they when they were that bad, it's uh, it's 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 unfortunate. And then when you have like a bad team like that that you root for, it's like it's hard to like find the positives because there there was none last year so it really they were like last year is like something uh i hope i never have to think about ever again as like a giants fan like i don't want to ever look back on that year you know i see j ray laughing down there i'm getting i feel like i'm getting emotional over here trying to talk about this damn team (laughs) listen bro i i i i I was a believer in the giants last year too man when uh when danny dimes bursted onto the scene and he had that big game against the buccaneers i was like 
New Wait Orleans. a minute. Oh, when he was a rookie, that was two years ago. Yeah, yeah. two years ago. I, I was I was all in. I was like, yo, Danny Dimes really might be uh the franchise. This, this, this might be nice, man. And I remember he had that big game against Philadelphia. I think it was Sunday night where he was running and, and, and fell close to the end zone. But what was worse, that favorite. or the QB sneak on third and nine? The QB, <laughs> listen, the QB sneak on third and nine is easily worse. That Daniel Jones play is just in my mind cemented as something that was so cool because it's like, you know, the read option. He fools everyone. For some reason, this guy fools everyone on the read option every time they run it. And he's down in the field, and I'm like, look at him go. And then, like, I was watching with my college roommates. And then I, <laughs> you see, like, just one step after another, like, the the wobble. And then I was like, there he goes. He the went down. Falling off. And then Joe Buck goes, he trips. He tripped. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, like, a play that, like, it's obviously not, like, a good play. But I don't know. He ran for, like, 80 yards. Like, it's a far run for a quarterback. I just thought it was pretty, I don't know, it was pretty impressive for him to do that. So, I, I always, it's, like, a good memory for me, that play. It's not, That's like, a, a bad memory. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so let me, let me read something to you guys so to kick off this Giants talk. Go ahead. 2017, the Giants finished 13 and 3. 2018, 5 and 11. 2019, 4 and 12. 2020, 6 and 10. 2021, 4 and 13. So I'll kick it off to the Giants fan here. What's the direction? What, what are we looking looking at for this upcoming year for the Giants? For me personally, it's just a being a competitive team this year. It's not about wins or losses. Obviously, I want to see more wins this year. But last year, what was it, four and thirteen? Correct? correct. They were. It's got it. There, it can't get much worse than that. Like last year was bad. You guys all saw it. Week seventeen, I was at that game. Their QB sneaking in on third and nine to get <laughs> better field position for the punter. That Riley Dixon, you know, he just got cut thankfully, but he was the worst punter in the NFL, and we're going to give him more field position to work with um whatever but no I think the direction I like what they did how they really like it's finally time like you actually John Maris steps up and is like we're cleaning house when they allowed Dave Gettleman to step down they didn't fire him which I think is it's very ridiculous to me that they that they were that friendly with that guy after all he's ruined for this team um and I thought they were going to keep Joe Judge too but I'm happy they they cut him too they said listen we got to start fresh here and this is the direction we got to go we got to find a new guy and Joe Shane, the new GM, and Brian Dable, the new head coach, both guys from Buffalo. Um, I like them a lot so far. They have their heads on swivels, you can tell. And they're, they're more modern football-like guys. They're more up to the times with football. It's not like Dave Gettleman, you know, we're going to run through the trenches. We're going to do it old school, this and that. There's a lot to look forward to with this team in the upcoming years. They drafted well. I, li- I, just, I like what they've been doing a lot. And John Mayer is giving Joe Shane the full reins to do whatever he wants. He's basically like, I'm the owner of the team, but you're going to be calling all the shots. And I, I really think that's important for the general manager to do that. I'm just hoping they're competitive, Justin. To get down to your real question, I just hope they're competitive. I hope they win some games. I hope they make a push for the playoffs. It, it'd be nice. You know, I think the fans, I think the fan base deserves it. And I honestly think the NFL does too. You know, seeing bad teams, it stinks. Obviously, like, Oh, like your team plays a bad team. It's like, oh, great. This is like an easy win this week. We need it. But like, wouldn't it be more fun if just every team in the NFL was good and it was a battle every week? And that's how I feel. So I just hope, I just hope they get better. I really do. I'm, I'm pushing for them this year. So I don't know. I got a lot of, I'm always positive, dude. I'm always positive. So uh, just to jump on that last point you made about uh, it's better for the NFL uh, NFL and not, I I, I think that's an uh, unarguable point. Like, um, in basketball it's the same in basketball it's the same in baseball it's the same in hockey yeah when your big market teams and new york is a is one of the biggest if not the biggest market um uh towns cities i should say um in the world it it's it's better when the giants are doing are doing good to a lesser extent the uh the jets and uh i think a lot of people forget that Buffalo is in New York and they have three football teams in New York, but um, <laughs> that neither is neither here nor there. With the Giants this year, right? Uh, I think they hit really well in the first round. I got to admit. I mean, two top 10 picks. They got uh, Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, fifth overall defensive end out of Oregon, and uh, Evan uh, Neal, seventh overall offensive tackle from Alabama. And we've seen the Alabama offensive linemen produced in the NFL at high level. So that's sure up uh, two big weaknesses for the giants that they, uh, 
needed uh, badly. What what I and me and JQ have talked about it all the time. He likes to joke about it, and you know, he's a big Daniel Jones fan. And I just I, I knew in his listen, he could say whatever he wants, but I knew in his heart of hearts he didn't believe in this guy. All right, he might love him as a person, and he's probably a great kid, a great guy, you know, a, a good person you want to talk to, have a conversation with. But as far as his quarterback play, it's just not there. It was a failure. They declined his fifth year option. I mean, you look at the numbers that he's put up. Yeah, he he can he can run and whatever, but I mean, twenty four touchdowns, twelve interceptions his rookie year, eleven touchdowns, ten interceptions his second year, and ten touchdowns, seven interceptions his uh, this last year. And I know maybe what John is going to say after I'm done with this is, oh well, look, he didn't have the talent surrounding him, or this and that, or no, he he's just like yeah, Daniel Jones is a failure too. Okay, good, um, but. Listen, I don't even think if Daniel Jones really had the time, I, I just don't, I, I didn't believe in him when he was drafted. I, I, I didn't, I didn't think he was the guy. I think a lot of people, you know, said he, he looks like a, a Manning and they put a lot of stock into that and hope to God, but he doesn't play like a freaking Manning. This is not Arch Manning. This isn't, this isn't him. All right. That's in a couple of years. <laughs> uh, the new regime. And uh, like uh, JQ uh, said, uh, Joe, Sh- uh, how do you pronounce Shane. his last name? Shane, like S H A N E. But it's, it's okay, Shane. Joe Shane. Yeah. And uh, head coach Brian uh, DeBall or DuBall, however Dable. you say it. Uh, both, yeah. yeah. Bo- uh, both from Buffalo. So um, the Buffalo uh, the Buffalo Mafia has taken over uh, the New York Giants franchise. New Jersey. Uh, I-, I think that um, Dan Jones is going to have another bad year. Uh, and I think they're going to, they're, they're going to, this new regime is going to look to draft their guy in 2023. So uh, I just look and I say that they're not going to – I don't think they're going to be competitive. I know JQ is hoping and praying to God that they will. I don't believe so. I think they're going to be dead last in this division. I think they're going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL. Me, Justin, and um, uh, John talked about our top five uh, or bottom five worst teams in the NFL. I I don't know if all three of us had the Giants in there, but I I know I – I certainly did. Yeah, I definitely had the Giants in there. Uh, and, and just to point, uh, Justin, I mean, John hit on it earlier in uh, the episode. Uh, James Bradbury's gone, who was a pro bowler in 2020. Uh, they released him. He was signed by Philly. And that Save cornerback that room is, uh, is, uh, with, has a lot of young, unproven talent. And I, I just don't see the Giants making any noise. Sure. Let me just shed a little positivity on the Giants. I want to I, I, wait, wait. Can I, can I absolutely say that? I, I know you're going to shed positivity. We're not done talking negative. Can I have to say something? Oh, you got some bumps. <laughs> can you do, bad. You want to add the negatives bad. now? Just do the negatives now. No, Let's get that out. <laughs> Let's just do the negatives. Let's get that out. Right. Yeah. So, what year did uh, – what was the former GM's name? I'm blanking on his name, JQ. Dave Gettleman. Dave Gettleman. When you look at his uh, – his We were resume. talking before about the Bears and the, the damage of Ryan Pace as the Bears general manager. When you look at the the Giants' recent draft history, I don't know that there's a team in the NFL who has drafted worse and more harmful long term than what Dave Gellman has done. So we're gonna talk about some some nice picks in there. But he comes in what year? Is it 2014, 2015? Yes, I believe it was the 2015 season. 2014. Yeah. It's around that timetable. Yes. So he starts off Eric Flowers in 2015, ninth overall pick. Gets Landon Collins in the second round. Very good value pick. 30, 33rd overall. 2016, Lay Apple, Sterling Shepard in the second round. 2017, Evan Ingram, Dalvin Tomlinson, Davis Webb in the third round. 2018, you have your option to take a franchise quarterback, whether it was Sam Darnold, who was projected to be the first overall pick, and then Baker went number one overall. You could have went offensive line with Quentin Nelson. Justin was talking about this in our last episode. No, I there heard it. I, I, saw it I saw it TikToks. I saw there are many TikTok. different ways the Giants could have went. They decided to go running back with a second overall pick in a league where running back does not matter. True. And we've talked about That's this with, with James Conner, and we've talked about how these players, they provide value to teams that have big-time breakout years, but the reality is Steelers let go of Le'Veon Bell. Their yards per carry goes up from 3.7 to 4.3 yards. Same as acting with all these backs. Look at Ty Gurley, David Johnson, all those guys have big-time breakout years, and they're gone. Yeah. Taking a running back in the first rounds when you have no offensive line, 
And oh, by the way, Eli Manning is going to his final two years and he has no protection. It's a little bit questionable. And you need the Eli Manning successor. Instead, they go running back and then offensive guard. They go Will Hernandez. Will Hernandez, is he on the team anymore? Oh, no, he's on the Cardinals. No. Okay. So then you move on to 2019. They take Daniel Jones, number six overall. He has no protection. It was a very big time reach. We got that. That's their guy. Okay. Dexter Lawrence, pick 17. Is he on the Giants? Oh, he he is. He's a starter for them. That's nice. DeAndre Baker, is he on the Giants? No, he he is not on the Giants. He got arrested one one summer. Yep, and he is gone. Mm-hmm. Darius Slane's on the Giants, fifth round pick. Then you look at 2020. Andrew Thomas was a very good pick. I think he had some struggles as a rookie, and then he started to correct that as the year went on. He's progressing to one of the best young tackles, right? You would agree? Has the Giants fans yes, watching? Yeah, sorry. I thought, you, I thought you were like pausing for yeah. a second. I, I stopped watching the yeah. Giants last year after Daniel Jones went hurt. I didn't watch a single game. I saw the third nine, the QB snake. Why? I didn't want to watch Mike Glennon at all or Jake Fromm a little I'd bit? I'd rather watch Paint Dry, personally. Okay. <laughs> I mean, listen, listen. I, you might find, I, I might have been more entertaining to watch that. Trust me. The I watched it. around my eyes. Yeah. Likely. But no, yes, Andrew Thomas. Yes, that was like his, that was probably his best pick um, all those years. And it's probably because they couldn't get Chase Young because they, the, the yeah, Washington him, jump had the pick before. So. Beyond that, I will give Gilman credit. He took Xavier McKinney in the second round. Last year, okay. he made big-time plays. So you guys, five interceptions. He had an impressive second year after uh, being injured his first year in the league. So I'll give him credit for that draft. That was a good year. That was, that was a good pick. Shout-out to him for that that one class he didn't totally screw the franchise over with. <laughs> I almost just fell over. When we talk about how bad a job he did in 2018 2019, there's no coming back from that anytime soon. I mean, you had the opportunity, number two, number six, and you take two players in Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones. One is overpaid and injury prone. The other is not even getting his fifth-year option accepted. So you, you could have went so many different ways and actually valued offensive line and then quarterback to set up a, a young quarterback not to fail, but they sound not to fail. And with Daniel Jones, he is – supposed to be a new york darling because when you've been starved the success for so long and a young guy comes in it gives you moments last year against the saints you guys have an incredible game where danny put up 400 yards saquon was healthy them boys beat a good team in new orleans and it was awesome and through the years you've seen progress throughout the season in new york there have been some bad games there have been blowouts but you look the 2020 daniel jones second season in the league they were up there at Pittsburgh, Chicago, Tampa Bay. You look at that season, they were losing. I think they started off 0-4, 0-5, 0-6, right? Yeah, but you, yeah the, I think so. While they were losing a lot, I'm not saying this to, to joke around, in 2020, unlike 2021, when Daniel went down after, I think, the, the 11th game of the season, yes. you mm-hmm. saw the progress where they were competitive, and, and Joe Judge was getting the collective buy-in from, from his players. Very and you're true. saying to yourself, Judge, hey, look, he may have been a special teams coordinator in New England, but this Giants team is kind of coming together, and they nearly beat Tampa Bay. I mean, you look at the 2020 season, all those games are losing. Almost beat Dallas. They almost beat Philadelphia. Tampa Bay, like I said two times before, they beat Seattle. I think Russell Wilson was playing that game. You yes, beat he was. Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow, did he play in that game? No, that's – that. They, he got hurt the week before. That's when he tore his ACL. Yep. Or, so they beat or, Brandon Allen. That's a, that's a really hard matchup. And they even beat the Cowboys in the meaningless Week 17 game. There was progress during those years. And when Daniel Jones went down last year with the neck injury, all of that went to the fan. I mean, God bless the Giant fans for watching that garbage that was being put out there week to week. I mean, Me, you every, guys. Every day, every snap, I'm your guy. I watch how are every you feeling? Day. How do I feel? Like afterwards? Those six, those six weeks of football. Was that the worst product you've ever seen in your entire life? Probably, yeah. Because you, you guys know this. I mean – I've seen like Super Bowls, you know, I've seen two Super Bowls. Uh, I know you guys have, you guys have, honestly, all your teams, you guys have seen two Super Bowls with a lot of fans like us aren't as lucky as we are us four. like our teams have been good. You know, my team hasn't been stellar. I mean, for Brandon and and Jay Ray, their team has been phenomenal. Like, you know, a lot of people don't get to see that, which is unfortunate, but you know, like for 16 years, I had the same quarterback. It was never like an issue. It was like, Oh, who, what, what's the quarterback controversy this year? It was the same guy for like my entire childhood which is awesome. Like I, I'll never trade like any of those moments for the world. And you know, like there's going to be ups and downs. And last year was definitely the worst year I've ever witnessed in my life. And it was just like, you know, fans want to go to games, this and that. Like I went to the week 17 game, people were leaving after the first quarter. So I just like moved all the way down and I just, you know, I, I enjoyed what I could, you know, I got Saquon the sign of my Jersey after that game, my Penn state Jersey, which was awesome. 
Um, but, you know, it, it hasn't been fun. And then, you know, but, you know, it comes with the team and then it's history. There's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, and there's going to be, there's going to be some really tough downs. And I think I saw that uh, last year for the first time ever. That was a real, like, wake-up call. I was like, I was like, this team is like, they shouldn't even be in the NFL. Like, they're so bad. Like, you know, it's just like one of those, like, reality calls and you're like I, i'm like i'm gonna watch them this week like, like I, I gotta do this it's like i gotta force myself to watch my favorite team so you know it, it's got its perks man it, it really does so i'm just hoping they get better but dave gettleman definitely the drafting was uh was not the best and obviously you guys know like the running back it's not a valuable position like very you know replaceable i get it like you know when they drafted safe one i was jumping for joy because he's he's been a, he's my favorite player i've been watching him since he was a freshman at Penn state, like that's where my true love started for him. I didn't even think he was going to be on the giants one day. And then, you know, three years later comes around and they're picking him second overall. I get it. Like, you know, people always tell me like, Oh, you love the guy, but like you love the pick. And I'm like, no, I don't, to be honest. And like, I, I honestly do wish Saquon got the benefit of the doubt, went to a better team with like a good offensive line. I wish Dave Gettleman didn't think, Oh, we can win now. So let me go draft the stud running back. You know, I, like you guys have seen his talent. He was probably like one of the most talented running backs since Adrian Peterson to ever come out of college. He's, he was that good. And, you know, you saw it his first year, he ran for 1300 yards. He, he combined for 2000 yards receiving and, and rushing, you know, total yards from scrimmage. He had 91 catches. He set like a, a franchise rookie record for the giants, or even it might even be an NFL. Um, but you know, it just sucks. Like he did all that without an offensive line, you know, then he gets hurt and then he gets hurt again. It's just, it's tough because, like, I love them and people, you know, they do give them a lot of crap. And, like, it, it's understandable, you know. Like, when we talk about our top five running backs, you'll see, like, I can't I can't be putting them in there. It's a little, like, you know, preview. Like, he's my guy. I'm I'm very biased towards him. But it just sucks. I just, like, hope this year, you know, he kind of, kind of, you know, gets a – goes up one on the haters and, you know, has, like, a, a solid year. That, that would be – that would be big for me to see him play and just, like, stay healthy, you know. That's, like uh, – a big as like a big Saquon fan it's, it's bigger than football for me it's just like to see him do well because he's a good guy like you guys were saying Daniel Jones he's a good guy you know he might not be the best quarterback but he he carries himself well they stay out of trouble they don't do anything bad you know they watch film on like Kyler Murray you know they don't need that in their contract <laughs> clause um but I don't know like they're a good group of guys and you know they fight hard uh I don't know they're just it, it does it's just just my team and like I you know I've been talking for like five minutes now I could talk about these guys all day so I like when he I like when you guys take over you could say some bad things because I, I agree there's there is a lot of bad things to look at like some of those contracts like Daniel Jones they had to decline that fifth year option he was due like 22 million dollars this year you're gonna pay that guy 22 million dollars like you, you just you can't do that so you know it it's a make or break year for a lot of guys and I hope like with this new regime regime of like often like you know the the general manager a new uh, head coach that like maybe they can bring out the best of Daniel Jones. Maybe we'll see more games like he did against the saints like that, that game. I've never seen him sling the ball like that. Like that was sick. So hopefully we can see more of that. That's all I want. So you know, Yeah. I see. I'm going to build off of his positivity a little bit. So as a Nick fan that, that has been tortured and abused much like you have over the last five years, you know, all, all that we have to hang on to is a little bit of positivity. We can't stare at the negatives too often or else we'll never enjoy the, enjoy the sport or our team. Yeah. But let me highlight something for you for Daniel Jones. First year in the league, he had Pat Shermer and Mike Shula as his head coach and offensive coordinator. His last two years, Joe Judge and Jason Garrett. Freddie Kitchens. Okay. Oh, Freddie. yeah, I forgot it. Freddie Kitchens, too. I forgot so, it. He, he hasn't had the, the greatest coaching room on the offensive side to help coach him up and to take him to that next step. So – I'm not going to be so down on Daniel Jones. I don't think he's as bad as, of a quarterback as we've seen the last two years. I think he does have 25 touchdowns in his arsenal. I don't think he's going to be a 10 touchdown, 11 touchdown kind of guy. Uh, using his legs more, he can be an explosive quarterback. He has that part of his game if he gets that protection. And I am a fan of the receiving core. I think Kadarius Toney is super talented. And if they can find a way to get him the ball more often in the slot – That'll be big time. Sterling Shepard's no joke. Uh, Darius Slayton is a go-getter. I think Kenny G, we, he had a down year, sure, but they need to force feed that guy the ball because he was eating in Detroit. That's a talented weapon on the outside. Giants have weapons. They, I'm not going to say they're a playoff team. I think they're far from it. There's a lot of steps that need to be taken. But much like my Knicks, and, I, and I've preached to you guys this before, this is a team that I feel finally has a little bit of direction. Dable and Shane in the fold, 
I think Giants have a little something to be more optimistic about. So while this year there may be some pains that that comes with it, but all in all, I think at the end of the season, you're going to be like, okay, I got something to be excited for in the coming future, you know? I hope so. I, I mean, I think I agree with you, with you uh, Jerry, and on your points. I just hope – I hope I can see this head coach, Dable, stay for at least two years, three years. You know, maybe maybe we get a head coach that stays for a little bit. So, But, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a, a year of learning. You know, it's a whole new playbook once again. Mm. Daniel Jones is, I think, third or fourth head coach now, and it's like his fourth offensive coordinator. I think Jason Garrett honestly threw him back in his uh, – in his building process, I think like, you know, all like the, Oh, we're going to stay away from the turnovers, but now Dable's coming in. He's like, I want you to be aggressive. I want you to throw the ball. I want you to take these chances. And I think that's why Kenny Galli had such a down year. They never, they never targeted him. And like, they couldn't get him the ball because the offensive line, you know, was a mess. Um, so we'll see. I mean, Kadarius Tony's a baller. I think, I think he's going to be really good. And, you know, we talked about the guys they drafted cave on Thibodeau, you know, he was at one point, five months before the draft, he was the, you know, consensus number one overall pick like everyone thought he was going number one he drops to the Giants at five I think they got very lucky with their two picks they landed right in their laps and I think Evan Neal's going to be a stud I really think they're going to be good and I think a name to look out for this year is Wandale Robinson I think a lot of people were iffy on the pick at first in the second round it's like whoa another receiver I just think you know Sterling Shepard he's not healthy right away he might be ready week one after the torn Achilles but you know, you got you got a lot of these speedy guys, these quick guys who can, you know, take it to some of these bigger cornerbacks, you know, that don't move well later, laterally. So we'll see. I don't know. I just hope competitive, competitive, competitive. Just stay in games. <laughs> which they were in 2020 for all of those. No, which was cool. They had a lot of games where they lost by like one touchdown or less, which was cool. Um, it's unfortunate that they, they, they couldn't make the playoffs that year, but hey, kind of worked out for the best because then they had a better draft pick and then you know they traded with the bears and then now you see these these two picks their first you know picks five and seven they got hopefully two cornerstone guys one at the end and one at right tackle now so i'm looking forward to watching those two play this year yeah this is what happens in a franchise actually values offensive line in the first round may not be the the sexy running back pick but you know offensive line is kind of important you actually can keep that as players you got a man brandon knows it saquon's a cute guy brandon knows i could see it in his face (laughs) A handsome dude I, I can't I, i'm not no, no hate no hate he's a handsome dude uh ju- just to um just to uh round out this nfc uh east discussion uh i i just do want to say the nfc east really is the nfc least <laughs> like it, it it really is it's the worst division in football uh i i just look around if you look at every other division in football right I think you can say that at least one team in each division has a a championship aspirations in their future in in this upcoming season. I I look at every team like Bucks, Green Bay, uh, Rams, Bills, Bengals, Indianapolis, uh, and then Mahomes with the Chiefs Uh, and Chargers. Three in that one division you can look at. Exactly. Every team, every division has at least one team, right? Some even have multiple, like Jake, you just said. This is the only division in football that nobody is saying has a championship aspiration. But the Cowboys want to win a title. They're, That's what their sights are on. They, they don't worry. want to, but like, let's get to the nitty gritty. You all three picked the Philadelphia Eagles to win the division. I think they can. I think realistically, they have a. You think you they this can? This roster but you is re- very similar if, to that 2018 team in terms of talent. I think they're going to be good. John, 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 bad. John. Gun to your head, do you think that one of these teams has a chance to win a Super Bowl this year? This season, no, but the Eagles are still like early in the rebuild. How many people expect the Eagles to make the playoffs no, last year? Not many people. I, am, I, I get that. I get that. that. That's future. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about this year, just this year solely. No. I think no, no team. Obviously How about the next three years? You're talking about – you were saying in the future you, none of these teams has legitimate chance. No, 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 no. I, I was just talking about this year. I was just talking about this year. I, I, I didn't want to bring up the future because a lot of things can change. I was talking about specifically this year. This is the only division where none of these teams are going to make a run. Like if any team makes it to the playoffs, I, I see a first-round exit instantly or first-game exit. Yeah, I think the Eagles so, can definitely want a playoff game. I think I, I, if they if make, you can I, run the ball I, in January, I highly doubt it. 
You win games in the trenches, and if you could run the football with a quarterback that's improving, a leader at quarterback, unlike Garson Wentz, a young head coach who figured out, hey, we're pretty good running this football, we're going to continue doing that, and you supply him with two of the best young receivers in the NFL, one of the better tight ends by far, so long as the offensive line stays healthy. What is the weakness with that Eagles team around Jalen Hurts? A quarterback, I believe, can be one of the better guys at the position, no doubt, and even could sneak into the MVP race. Well, just like Dak Prescott didn't show up in that playoff game last year, uh, neither did Jalen Hurts. Yeah. That's a forgettable Trump. game. So, How old is Jalen Hurts? Trust. First year as a starter? First, first time around. First time around. The first Dak's time been around. starting for right. six years, right? It was first time around. It was. It was. But it was a forgettable first time. Can I uh, step in first? Before we, like, I know we're finishing the NFC East right now. Great conversation, by the way, guys. That's cool. It's uh, NFC East, NFC Least. I get it. Um, <laughs> I have I three it. just, like, yes or no yeah. questions for you guys about the Giants. I just want to see. You can, like, add on, like, a, a side note, whatever. Okay? You guys yeah. ready? Yep. Yeah. Um, are the Giants going to win six or more games this year? No. I'll take them at six. Yeah. Si- yeah. Six. It's okay. Yeah. Johnny T. Big answer here, Johnny. No. T. no. Okay. All right. Um, will Daniel Jones be the quarterback of the team moving forward in 2023? No. No. He's got to have a. He's got to have a good year to to. Yeah. to stay. No, he really does. Wow. But, but what do we consider a good year to, to get him to be quarterback next season? I think he's got to throw at least 25, 30 touchdowns. Well, look, look at it. Look at it. Look at it this way. Stay like JQ said, helpful. they couldn't really give him uh, – they couldn't really give him the fifth year because of their, their cap situation. They can't sign him to an extension because of their cap situation. They would have to franchise tag him, and that's an insane amount of money right there. Well, how has he developed it. the last two years? So he's done nothing to improve. That, that's what I'm saying. I'm no, I'm on your side. Don't come at me, John. I'm just saying. I'm the one who deserve, said Jay Joe's deserve? not the guy. I, I want to point. I, I want to point the finger at Jason Garrett. So yeah. Okay, wanna, you can. I agree with you guys too. It's tough, like to be like, oh, like we can build off this kid. You know, like it stinks. Um, you know, also a good guy. Another good guy. Um, <laughs> awesome. But like you said, like franchise tag would cost a lot. You know, you can go draft someone, but I just don't want to get in that carousel of having bad quarterbacks oh let's just sign like a a veteran to on one, one year deal like i just want someone who's gonna play like for a couple i mean i was spoiled obviously 16 years maybe like four or five years i don't know something mm-hmm. like that but they need a franchise guy and i don't know hopefully he takes like a crazy leap but i think you know back to what justin was saying what does he have to do i think well i first think they got to win games i think you know his stats line it has to be good i think like i'm gonna be strict on him this year but I think they got to win games. I think they got to win like over seven games for him to stay. I for mean, starters, they, he has to stay healthy, my man. That's, stay that's healthy. the first step. He hasn't first played off. every year. So John's face was about to explode the second. I got, him. I got the franchise, franchise quarterback. quarterback. The two of you, JQ and Justin, you guys like Jimmy Garoppolo a lot. And recently, <laughs> reports have come out that he is talking to one NFL team, which by all accounts is the Giants, potentially through a trade, if not with that Debo Samuel uh, extension. Perhaps they end up cutting Jimmy. Is Jimmy New York safer the way you guys think? Because he's a solid quarterback that's a winner. And more importantly, he is a guy that's disrespected. Why not put him in New York with Brian Dable? What do you guys think about that? Is that the solution? Is that the JQ, guy? That, JQ, that's bait. Don't take it. I think it's bait, but he cut <laughs> him like six Super Bowls in a row, Jimmy G with the Giants. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, it's the problem is, is like if he's even cut, I don't even think the Giants could afford to pay him. They have no, they have no money. Like, you know, I don't even think they could. They can't trade for him. They have no value. I mean, they got nothing. They got nothing to work. So I think they, they got to stick with what they got. Next year, they're going to have like over like 72 million in cap space. They're going to have a lot of money next year. Um, so who knows? Maybe they make a move for like a big name quarterback. As long as it's not Baker. As long as it's not Baker, I'll be fine. Baker doesn't want to go there. I hope. Baker doesn't want to be a part of that mediocrity. Good, good. I hope. I hope. I, you, know, I, you know what's an interesting one to me? Bless you, John, uh, even though you muted you. on time. Uh, I think uh, the Kirk Cousins experiment in Minnesota is coming to a close pretty soon. Yeah, I think so too. Maybe, what I think uh, what you're asking? Maybe, maybe he might be a potential fit. Yeah, I'd take him. I, I like. I don't think he's the best quarterback, but like, who? I, I think it was Jay. Right? You guys were saying like uh, that fifteen to like twenty range of quarterbacks, like Tannehill, Baker, yeah. Cousins. Like any of those guys, the way they play, like I think I, um, you know, like I would take a guy like that. I wish Daniel could be like, like 
where they are at. I know he's like towards the bottom, obviously. We haven't seen a lot. Um, but I wish he could be like a guy like that, like a top, like, you know, not 15, excuse me, but like a 15, like 20 range type of guy. That'd be, that'd be cool to see. Uh, All right. Before we wrap up the Giants talk, I want to say over under on uh, Daniel Jones touchdowns over 24 and a half. Over. I'm slamming I'm the under. Slamming. Does that count for rushing or just throwing? A total. Oh, total. Over. Oh, total over. over. He's going to rush for 20 touchdowns this year. You can't. <laughs> I'm I think no, I, I it has it it just has to be over. It has to be. There's no there's no like oh like what if they win less and like, I feel the real over is uh eleven yeah. games played. I think that's what we really have to be looking yes. here. I know he's gotta play, he's gotta play every game. Order, yeah, he's gotta actually stay healthy to reach that. I'm gonna go to the under because I don't know if he's gonna stay healthy. Even with I think Evan Neal's a stud. I think he's gonna be awesome at tackle. And that's even still, I mean boy. where's this offensive line coming? I don't think one guy as a rookie is gonna solve those issues. So yeah, I'm taking the under on 24 total touchdowns because Deuce Flash, uh, has he gotten that since his rookie year? Let's check. No. no. So if there's anything for a giant thing that Hainer had under G- GM is no longer Dave Gellman, that's good news. Let's move on to the running backs now, shall we? Unless Wait, you guys one more question. Yes, sir. question. Yes or no. Giants week one versus Titans in Tennessee. I think they win. What do you guys think? I think they surprise. I think I think it's week one. I think anything can happen. You've seen Tannehill. He has those three pick games. I think I think if he has a bad game, I think they they take a win there in, in sure. Tennessee. They That's could week one's week one is always a toss up, but uh, I think Derrick Henry is going to carry I that. Can't, team. I can't ever get Brandon to agree with me on anything. <laughs> I can't. I can't get him. I can't crack him once. I obviously, it's not about a good team, but maybe in the running backs will agree on something. Johnny T, I'll let you. You you. Uh, I want you to read my running back. List. My uh, my running back list from last night. It's changed a lot since last night. Tell him, make sure. So yeah. So <laughs> when, I, when I was telling JQ last night, we'd be ranking running backs. You know, I expect him to have Saquon Barkley in his top five as a a biased Giant fan. And the list he sent me, it, I did not expect this. It was number one, Saquon. Number two, Saquon. <laughs> number three, Saquon. Number four, Saquon. And number five, Wayne Gallman. No. Wayne Gallman. <laughs> He's five. not even on your team anymore. Number five, Saquon. <laughs> the list has changed since, though. Don't worry. Oh, okay, good, good. You've had to change of heart. Yeah. What's you your list? Do you want, do you want that off? Because I have a... I can, I can go first if you guys would like. If yeah, I'm sure I want yeah, to sure. on in my top five. So I'm into it. All right, all right. So I'm going to start off my top running back in the NFL. It's always been the king, and it still will be the king, King Henry. I I don't care what anyone says. I'm not comparing the two, but I'm just saying, like the way Brandon Jacobs ran, like downhill, hard, like a big running back, trucking people over. It just reminds me a lot of Derrick Henry, and obviously this guy's like. 10 times better and just bigger and faster. So you can't go wrong with him. The foot injury last year was like a freak accident. You know how he gets hurt like that. If he doesn't get hurt, I, you know, he's probably like setting all like NFL running back records last year. Like he was on pace. I forgot what the pace was, but like through like the first couple of weeks, he had like 600 yards or something. It was ridiculous. It was unbelievable or whatever it was. Um, Almost a what? thousand yards in eight games. In eight games, and he's and he was still like number two. <laughs> That's insane, dude. I know. And he was still number two, like rushing yards, like like stat wise in the NFL, like for like another five weeks, and he didn't even play those five weeks. So yeah, yeah, I um, think so. Unbelievable. Number two, I have Jonathan Taylor. I think he's a rising star. He's young. He's he's literally around our age, 23, 24, 22. Um, I think he's going to be great. He plays behind a great offensive line. And I just think, you know, the sky's the limit for that kid. I think he's going to be dominant again this year. And he, and he can catch the ball, too. Guys like Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb, they got, like, stone hands. They can't catch all the time. Um, number, three, kid. number three is where it gets a little interesting for me. I have Dalvin Cook. I still think Dalvin Cook's a good running back. I think, you know, he can catch. He can do it all. And I think on that Minnesota team, it's a great mix with – how much they throw the ball. It's, it's very reliable. I feel like for Kirk cousins to hand off the ball to a guy like Dalvin cook, um, the speeds there, obviously a great player in fantasy as always. He has been, you know, he did get banged up last year, but happens to all happens to all running backs. They all get hurt at some point. Um, number four, Nick Chubb. I got to put Nick Chubb in there. He's, he's dominant. I know he runs behind the best offensive line in the league. And I've seen, you know, I always see these memes on Twitter. He's running through like the A gap or like the garden tackle hold, the B gap, C gap. And it's like he's got like three feet 
like with wise to work with and like no one's touching him. So, but you know, he's just a hard runner. He runs downhill and you know, he makes, he makes people pay for mistakes and, and he's hard to tackle in the open field. He, you know, you just can't tackle him. Um, and number five, I actually can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm going to put Christian McCaffrey at number five. I can't believe I'm really doing mm. it. Him and Saquon, they played the same amount of games. I wasn't going to put Saquon in my top five. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be biased. It's even hard to put him in the top 10. We haven't seen a lot from the past two years. It sucks. Might be a shocker to you guys for me to say that. Um, but, you know, an honorable mention, I think, is also uh, Austin Eckler, Najee Harris. I think I think Najee is going to crack that top five next year, but I, I think it's going to be tough with that offensive line. I think Johnny T knows that as well, too. So That offensive line, I'm going to tell you, it was bad last year. Chuck Sikorafor is the one guy who retained through an extension. He was a right tackle who had some really bad moments, but – we bring in James Daniels from Chicago. Adam Mason Cole's already getting training camp fights. I like that. He's at center. Our, our rookie center last year, Kendrick Green, was pretty bad. So the left side of our offense line is really the question. We have a second-year player in Dan Moore Jr., a third-year guard, ideally in Kevin Dotson, although Kendrick Green might start there. But Green was playing out of position at center. Left side of that offense line is a little bit sketchy. We don't know. Right side, I think, is pretty good. And with Najee, as well touching this, I love Najee. He's, he can do it all versatile he can block he's awesome he's an amazing leader and i think he's going to be the face of the steelers offense because he is our offense quite frankly i mean he led the nfl as a rookie in total yards if i'm not mistaken in touches he is truly one of one as a back yeah and so he had 381 touches 1600 yards uh, from the last scrimmage which is just nuts and most of all he didn't fumble until the very end of the season against the ravens in week 17 where he got injured the dude's a stud but the one thing I do worry about with this offensive line is he was a, a high volume, the low usage back, low efficiency. And I really hope that the Steelers won't run him into the ground the way they did Le'Veon Bell because he's basically, like I said, our offense, but we don't have a guy to spell him. Benny Snell's had really good moments, and for some reason they didn't use him last year. I never understood that, quite frankly. They just want to use Najee. And I say to myself, if you invest a first-round pick in this kid at running back, it is an absolute shame if you're not going to spell him with a guy who can keep him available and in my top 10 I had some not a lot of honorable mentions because the running back position while it's the most in my opinion wasteless position football you don't want to invest a lot of resources into it it is so deep man I mean they just keep coming in and there's so much value in the back who as a rookie can just blast off for 1200 yards you know what I mean my top five Derek Henry number one look He's not the same pass catcher Jonathan Taylor is, and I get that. Though Taylor doesn't have the crazy receiving totals, he plays Naeem Hines and also Carson Wentz. I mean, get the guy. Ryan Tannehill for Derrick Henry is his quarterback, and that is the Titans' offense. That's what makes that thing go. And literally, when the Titans are down, they're running the football because Derrick Henry is that insane of a back. I mean, seven games last year, he had almost 900 yards. This is the type of guy we're talking about where you can't stop him. Four yards, four yards, four yards, 76. Four yards, four yards, 23, 17, 16. It's... The dude is one of a kind, and to me, he's the best running back I've seen since Adrian Peterson. I don't know if you guys would disagree with that, because there's really no one else. I never saw it take. Number two, I got Jonathan Taylor. As a rookie, was awesome then the season. Second year, best running back in the league last year. Number three, JQ. You got me to switch up. I Nick Chubb at number three, because he's averaging over 5.3 yards a carry. Yeah. That is insane. And the only other running backs to do that in NFL history are GM Brown and somebody else. So yeah. he's doing historical stuff. I was going to say they were, they were you know, you could flip-flop both, but I forgot to mention that. But, yeah, I agree. But then you realize, just like Jonathan Taylor, this Browns offensive line, Wyatt Teller, they had J.C. Treader, Joel Batonio, Jack Conklin at right tackle, Jedrick Wills at left tackle. To me, that's the best offensive line in football. What do you get? I don't know if you guys would disagree with that. I mean, it is. It is. It is insane. Sure, they don't have Quentin Nelson. So I said to myself, okay. Delvin Cook, I had because of injuries, you know, him at number four. But then Nick Chubb the last two seasons in the six games as well, which I think is one less than Dalvin. So I got Dalvin at number three. I think he'd be even better in Cleveland than Nick Chubb. But Nick Chubb's speed, his ability to run in between the tackles, the dude is an insane runner of the football. I mean, the Giants, maybe if they got him and Quentin Nelson, they'd actually be a competitive football. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, number five, I'm going to hit you guys with a curveball here. I have Austin Eckler, and it's not because of fantasy purposes – I look at a back who was hurt in 2021 or 2020, but this is a guy who, in my opinion, is the best receiving back in football. Christian McCaffrey hasn't been able to stay healthy, but last year he still still gave you 900 yards as a, as a runner. And if this guy is giving you 1,700 yards all purpose, and sure, the, the Chargers offense line is getting better. They've invested draft capital at the position. 
and Slater last year. They get a guy this year in Zion Johnson. But this offensive line is in Cleveland. You know, it's it's getting there, I think. But you look at what Nick Chubb has. As himself, Austin Eckler, sure, I think he hasn't shown it all yet. But I think this year he's going to establish himself in that top five camp. I would have had CMC there, but just like Saquon Barkley, I got Saquon at number 19. I think that the four, that is what, what it is right now for Saquon. Because I got young backs, young backs in there. Joe Mixon stayed healthy. Elijah Mitchell, he's an absolute stud. Mm-hmm. Oh, 14 or 1,100 yards, and I think 10 starts. I like what that did. The way that guy performs in San Francisco's offense, if you put Saquon there, I think Saquon would be better than Mitchell. But given the situation they're in, I, I can't just put Saquon ahead of Mitchell because, oh, he's in New York. I got to factor in the performance. That's why I got okay, Saquon I lower. Yeah, no, totally understandable. So that's why I have Eckler above McCaffrey and Kamara. I think Kamara can go in front of uh, Austin Eckler as well. Um, I think with those three backs, it's very similar. You got three of the best receiving backs. I called Eckler the best receiver out of those guys. I think he go either way. And I, quite frankly, I think with Justin Herbert, Austin Eckler, call me crazy. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a dark horse offensive player of the year candidate this upcoming season. Okay, very cool. I like it. Brandon, what's up? You want to go or I go? Uh, I'll hit it. Um, so, do we, uh, John? I, I missed your uh, number one running back. Was that Derrick Henry? Yes, said? sir. Derrick Henry. Okay, okay. King. Yeah, the king. Um, I'm uh, I'm not gonna waver on that. Derrick Henry's the best running back in football. I mean, the uh, he he's he's the epitome of built different in this league. Six three, two fifty, a freaking powerhouse who can also you know, run outside the tackles. And t- listen, if he gets ahead of steam going, you better get the hell out of the way. Cause you, you t- <laughs> Oh you my flat. God. Um, and it's not going to be good. Yep. Yeah, um, I mean, if there was ever a poster rise in the NFL, Derrick Henry <laughs> is right next to the uh, definition of uh poster eyes. Uh, number two, um, I got uh JT Jonathan Taylor out of Indy. Um, yeah, the O-line is one of the best in the NFL, but listen, uh, what really separates uh, the good running backs from the great running backs is the their le- level of um, play in the second level and the third level of the defense. Like, what can they do there? Can they break tackles? Can they make uh, people miss? What's their ball carrier vision like? Um, and Jonathan Taylor's vision in, um, coming out the backfield is one of the best in the NFL, being able to find small crevices and burst out a big play. I, I I was just looking over a, a little bit of stats on each guy and um, a gif right here. I don't know why they w- want to do this to me, but it's a, it's a play of um, uh, Indy against New England where Jonathan Taylor just sees a small little crevice, cuts to the right in the second level, blows by two guys and bursts for a touchdown. Um, the guy's uh, insane. He's only two years into the NFL. So, and and the, 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 uh, the jump he made from season one to two, 1100 yards to 1800 yards is is insane i I don't know if he's going to get to 1800 yards again he he easily could i'm not going to say he's not but might have like you know 1700 or 1600 but he's still going to be one of the top running backs in the league um number three i got nick chubb and the reason i got nick chubb is because he's usually always healthy i know last year was marred with injuries but that was for the most part all the cleveland browns were uh hit with injury the injury bug that year but nick chubb is usually a model of consistency um yeah again he's got one of the probably the best o-line in football he's got the best backup you could have in kareem hunt right next to him who compliments him nick chubb gets nick chubb gets the job done um just like jonathan taylor in the second level he he could break through tackles he can make you miss he's gonna do it all for you and and i know jq joked about uh, the stone hands but i think nick chubb is has got um has worked on it and he's got better in the uh the receiving uh aspect especially if kareem hunt is out he's gonna have to put on a little bit more of a workload yeah and uh number uh four i got um i got dalvin cook yeah he's been injured but at least he's still played like 14 or 13 games the last couple of seasons so it's not like christian mccaffrey where he's missed basically the last two seasons so and and you see the numbers dalvin cook is able to put up in just 14 or 13 games it's it's top five in the NFL. So just think if he can put it together and he's a very good receiving back, very reliable out of the backfield. Uh, D- Dalvin cook is if can stay healthy, 
he's, he's a very special player in the, uh, the NFL. And at number um, five, it's between McCaffrey and Kamara for me. I'm going to go Kamara because he's healthier. He's been healthy the last two seasons. McCaffrey has not been. Uh, he had those two great seasons back to back, you know, especially the big one where he had a thousand rushing yards and a thousand receiving yards. That's only been uh, done a uh, very few times in the NFL. I think Marshall Falk is one of the uh, other guys that has done that. So that's a elite company for McCaffrey to be in. And he is a special player when he's on the field, but he just hasn't been on the field. And to, um, I'm not, his injuries aren't the biggest concern for me because it's not like he tore his ACL or a meniscus or an Achilles or something like that. Like 20, uh, 2020, it was a um, high ankle sprain early in the season and then a shoulder injury that kept him out. And then this year it was a uh, hamstring and then a uh, ankle injury later in the season. Now the hamstring can be a problem, like for a, a lot of athletes, especially when you're running a lot, that hamstring can tighten up at moments notice and, and you, you're, you're done. You, you can't even walk anymore. Uh, so that's why I got Alvin Kamara ahead of him. Uh, I, I think he's, John thinks Eckler is the best receiving, but I think Alvin Kamara is right there with, with him, if not better. Um, yes, he's never rushed for a thousand yards, which is crazy to think of that Alvin Kamara has never done that, but that's just because he's getting the work done in so much. And especially he was playing with Drew Brees and it was a pass heavy offense, but I mean, he's had a career day. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's tied the NFL record for rushing touchdowns in a game with six, um, five, five, five touchdowns. Um, no, six. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> John's mess with you. I had the pinky. I had the pinky on the front of my hands. I was trying. Oh, to okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, Alvin Kamara is a beast. He's been on my fantasy team for the past couple of years, and I love having him. The production you get in the running game and in the receiving game is is next level. So that's my top five. What's crazy, so uh, me and Brandon literally have the same exact top five. I was wondering if anybody was going to plug Alvin Kamara there at five. I think he's probably the most talent, honestly, the most talented back out there. But they can knock him for the, the yards. What happened, you? I'm sorry. Isn't he suspended the first couple of games this year? Yeah, or no. Yeah. Or I don't think so. It's either suspension or injury. It's going to keep him out a couple of games this year. Suspension, I'm pretty sure, right? Is he injured as well? No, I don't I think might he's be getting him confused with Michael Thomas, but yeah, he, yeah, he's going to miss some time. Back from injuries in the yeah, he's left. missing. He's going to miss some time, Alvin Kamara. But yeah, Justin, I, I do agree. He is. He does it all, dude. He catches. He runs. You know, he, he, he can block. He, he literally is like the perfect like mold of like a running back. I feel yeah, like, like. I, I just think he's he's so scary. If you get him the ball down the sideline, just oh my gosh, man, he he makes so many people miss his balance running down the sideline. I've seen so many plays of him staying in bounds while while so many defenders are coming in towards his way. He's one of the most fascinating running backs. I remember he was even on the radar for New England when he was when he got drafted. I'm still mad, and I got another uh, running back that. So I have Derrick Henry, number one, who was number two. Jonathan Taylor, num no, Nick Chubb I actually had number two. Oh, so we switch. We that's, the only, that's my only swap. I have Nick Chubb number two, more because Jonathan Taylor has been in the league two years. I love the longevity that Nick Chubb has shown. Uh, he has the perfect running back mate with Kareem Hunt right there in Cleveland. He has a great offensive line, and he's always producing. I mentioned this before. He was in that draft with Saquon Barkley. And from the jump, I was like, yo, this guy's going to be the best running back in the draft. And I was so mad when New England selected Sony Michelle. When I was like, man, I wanted Nick Chubb so bad. I wanted Nick Chubb so bad. But I'm not going to slight Sony Michelle because he got us a Super Bowl. So it's all right, Justin. We, we wouldn't have paid him at the end of the day anyway. Yeah, so. you're right. You're right. Yeah. Probably not. I have him. I have Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor is an absolute monster. And while, well, yeah, I don't know if he's going to rush for 1,800 again, but it's definitely in, in, the, in the cards with that offensive line. Anything is possible there as long as he stays healthy. Um, I got Dalvin Cook, number four. As long as he's healthy and he's on the field, he's always a threat. He's super dynamic. And I got Alvin Kamar, like I said, number five. And my honorable mention, you're going to draw, you're going to probably say I'm crazy, but I think he can get there. And I'm going to highlight my boy in New England, Damian Harris. Ooh. I I don't know if there's many, many runners out there that run as tough as he does. I think he runs just as tough as a Derrick Henry, a Chubb, and a Jonathan Taylor. 
He doesn't get as many reps in the pass game. He, he was just shy of a thousand yards, but he did rush for 15 touchdowns. I vividly remember, I believe it was week two against the Jets, where he carried about three defenders into the end zone. He was just trucking along. And you know, on Good Morning Football, they have the uh, angry runs every week. It felt like every single week, Damian Harris was a candidate. Don't sleep on him. Well, I don't, I'm sure New England isn't going to pay him when it's time to, time to give it up. We have Ramondre Stevenson, who's another promising young back, who's, who's going to burst onto the scene again. But I don't know. Running backs are, are such a tricky one, but I think we can all agree. Nobody can take the crown from King Henry. And I have a hot take for you guys. When it is all said and done, Derrick Henry will have the record for most NFL rushing touchdowns. So touchdowns. Yeah. I think, I think touchdowns, yeah. And I, honestly, he should have broke the rushing single season record last year. He was he was on a crazy pace to him, and then he got hurt. So, But, yeah, he um, – long, long live the king, Justin. Long live the king. Long live the king. I find it so funny. Why did it take so long? It took two years for Derrick Henry. He didn't, he didn't break out to year three. And it was not. It was until the second half of the second of his third season that he they really were splitting out. time. Wasn't he splitting? Deion time Lewis. Something? That's when they realized. Oh, maybe yeah. we should give this guy Derrick Henry the football. He's you know yeah. invest a second round pick into him, and no one can tackle him. But yeah, Deion Lewis as well. I mean, how could he? You know, Deion Lewis or Derrick Henry? I mean, I would have the same issue myself too. So, so I, I he Derrick Henry gives me nightmares. Uh, Tom Brady's last game as a Patriot was ruined because of that guy. So. Well, no, I think um, I made a mistake because Deion Lewis came in 2018. It was DeMarco Murray when Derrick Henry came mm -hmm. in. So DeMarco was there in 2016 and 17, but 2017 was his last year in the NFL. He was not very good, three and a half yards a carry. His first year at the Titans was much better after his stint with the uh, the Eagles. So I so, uh, just want to say uh, for Justin's little hot take, I mean, I guess I will say it's possible. I mean, Derrick Henry's 28 right now. He'll be 29 in January. Um, he's got 65 rushing touchdowns right now. The record is 164. It's 100 touchdowns, basically, he's got to score. He's not catching Emmett Smith. I don't think he's going to catch him because of the league we're in now. I mean, the most touchdowns he's had in the season so far is 17 rushing. Okay, you gotta, but, but you think about it. Why together. not? So as time goes on and he tends and he ages, the guy is still going to be 6'3", 240. Yeah. As he ages, you can still hand him the ball in the red zone. Yeah, but 100 touchdowns is a lot of touchdowns. It is a lot. But, I mean, um, look at his I – don't, I don't know if somebody wants to do a quick math while I, I hit on another Justin uh, point, but he'd have to average, like – That's 99 TDs right there, so – it's it's over a couple of seasons he'd have that like let's say like it's 15 15 third like it, it's just it, it's going to take some time um but we'll, we'll laugh what i want to touch on correct. is is uh my boy who i've nicknamed big d damian harris all right that man I, I really love him um the first time i saw him play i fell in love his his toughness and like I talked about with uh, the elite running backs in the top five, what separates the good from the great is second level play. And Damian Harris is very good in the second level. He, he can blow pot, blow, blow by defenders. He can truck right through them. Like uh, Justin said, he can carry them on his back. Literally. Uh, he could stiff arm them. And yeah, he, again, he's it. He's in new England. So he's not going to get the, you know, reps, because uh, Bill is a uh, running back by committee guy, and he's got, uh, like Justin said, Ramon J. Stevenson behind him. James White's coming back this year. Uh, another electric player in J.J. Taylor that I really like. And uh, I think John touched on, they dra uh, they drafted a running back somewhere in the mid-rounds. Pierre Strong. Um, huh? Pierre Strong, I think his name is. Pierre Strong, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I really do love da uh, Damian Harris. I love the way he plays. It's uh, insane. I like him a lot too. I think he's a very good running back. I'm not gonna lie, I like him a lot. And like you said, New England, he's not gonna get that high volume of touches. Um, but J Justin, back to your point, I think Derrick Henry can do it. You never know. It, you know, if he plays for, just depends. I know we all know how the position is, but I don't know, man. The guy, we saw what he was doing this year, and I, I think about it. He he lost whatever six seven games. Could add up a bunch of. Times. 
touchdown there. You know, could have could have had ten more touchdowns right there. So I I think he would have gotten to twenty. I uh, probably yeah. Had he stayed healthy. I remember I played him one week in fantasy and and uh, I like it was a Monday night game. I think they were playing the Bills and I was like, All right, I need the Bills to shut him down. Like, like nothing. He ran for like seventy four yard touchdown on the first play. I was like, All right, I lost. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so I just did the math. Yeah. Ninety nine touchdowns, seventeen game season. The average guy is five point eight. So basically, if he can give you sixteen touchdowns a game for the next six years, he would be right there with Emmett Smith and Ladainian Tomlinson. Or How many years you said, Johnny? Basically, six years of seventeen touchdowns. Yeah, so he'd be he'd be thirty five, thirty five because he turns twenty nine. That's hard. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That, yeah, that's what I'll check back in on that in like two years and see where he's at, or like after every year. He's got to have a season like where one season he's got to have like 25 touchdowns. Because he's, 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 he's rushing, he's I'll, I'll call it. He's going over 18 this year. But here's the thing over. Would, over. Yeah, I would say I would hit the over. I think he'll stay healthy. And like without AJ Brown, he's going to be an even bigger focal. So Emmett Smith, the all time leader, when he was his age, he had 125 touchdowns, which, or no, sorry, 112 rushing. And then it was 119 total. So almost double that oh. amount. Yeah. At the He's same got age. 65. And that's what hurts him is that he was splitting time. As that as damn as DeMarco as Murray. Damn DeMarco Murray. <laughs> <laughs> now, I had Saquon. I said number 19 in my running back list. Yeah. Who, can I do... ask who in the top 10? I'm yeah. sorry. Can I ask not Let's go 20 through, through 10 who's beforehand? I want to ask you guys who is better running back edition. So I have Austin Saquon? Expert. Yes, I have Austin Eckler number five above Alvin Kamara. I think go either way, those guys. Six, Kamara or Saquon. Who are you guys taking? Kamara. He's healthy. You have to. Christian McCaffrey or Saquon Barkley? Who's better? I, I, I guess McCaffrey. We've seen him do some pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I have yeah, McCaffrey it's, it's at seven hard. just because he was even a little bit better than Saquon. It's a, it just, McCaffrey's had two great seasons. Saquon's only had one. When they were both healthy, I had them at one and two that one year. They were great. Like, they were stellar. Yeah. So, number eight, I have Javante Williams. I think it's where he's going to be by the season. That's a stretch. I, I wouldn't go that far yet. Yeah. The way he was breaking tackles at rookie splitting time, he had over 100, 1,100 yards. No, I get Aaron that. Jones, but I think Aaron it's Jones, just too early. Aaron Jones and Green Bay is better than him. We're about to get into that next. I have Aaron Jones right after him at number nine. Aaron Jones, yeah. Better than I think he's good, but I don't know. Like, I, I no, there, JQ, I like JQ that, a lot of this. JQ, there were times where Aaron Jones was the real Aaron on that football team. Like I mean, he was, at, he was yeah. carrying Aaron Rodgers. Only a couple. I'm it's not. Just, it's not blasphemous. Aaron Rodgers was the best player on the team, but there were a couple games that season where Aaron Jones was carrying, putting the team on his back. That dude has 40 touchdowns in the last three years I, total. It's hard for me also to say Saquon's better than any of these guys because, like, I'm trying to base it off what he's done the past, like, couple years. And I can't just, like, say everything from his rookie year, you know, because, like, that's in the past. So it's kind of, like, hard to put him. I I do think it's a bit disrespectful putting Devontae Williams all the way up there. He's splitting carries with Melvin Gordon. Well, that's the thing. I'm going performance-based. I got to stay low. Javante is a stud. I don't know, you guys are going to see next year. I mean, talk about fantasy football. Just take that guy if you're going to play fantasy football. No, 1,200 1, 1, yards from scrimmage in one start. Think about that. He's going to be the starter this year. I'm telling you, that's not a very good Broncos offensive line. You know, sure, it's it's not as bad as the Giants, but you look at the performance and the production as a rookie, that dude's only going to get better. And the amount of broken tackles, he is a stud. I think he's better than Najee, and that's coming from a Steeler fan. I have Najee at number 10. Who is better, Najee or Saquon? Again, my stuff's off performance mostly. Last two years. Yeah, I guess Najee. He had a good year. He had a really good year. I love his running style. Yeah. Hard runner. I like him a lot, too. I had Elijah Mitchell and Joe Mixon right after Jones and Najee. So I have Elijah Mitchell 11 and Joe Mixon at 12. I'll take Saquon over Joe Mixon. Me too. Yeah. That Bengals offensive line is not a whole lot better. Mitchell's good. Mitchell's very good. Stuck. Mixon's a bomb. I like Mixon. Mixon's a beast, yeah. Let I me think see he's underrated. I need to hear the next couple of names. Who else is in there? Ezekiel Before Elliott 19. I have above him at 13. Then I got – who you guys got? Ezekiel Elliott or Saquon Barkley? 
they're kind of both in the same field because they both haven't played well in the last couple of seasons. Well, if, Zeke's if been I'm getting, healthy and produced the last three years. If I'm getting this version of Zeke, I'll take my chances with the explosiveness of Saquon. The dude can't run between the tackles. I mean, and Zeke can't give you more than four yards now. I'm pretty sure he can. Yes, he has. Yes, passing yes. game, though. Sa- Saquon's going to be – like Saquon's going to be playing a lot of receiver this year. He's not just going to be running the ball. They're actually going to get him in open space this year. So that's why maybe next year we do another episode. And when Saquon, you know, one of the better running backs in the league, well, you know, we'll, we'll, I have we'll AJ back Dillon about Saquon as well because AJ Dillon's a stud. Whoa. Good luck uh, tackling that guy. Whoa. Yep. AJ Dillon about Saquon. Yep. That's crazy. No, it's not. Have you seen this dude? No one can stop him. He is. Don't get me wrong. Great, hey, but like, Wow. Just like Javante, 1,100 total yards. You got to think of Saquon's talent, though. And, like, I get it. He hasn't done a lot the last couple of years. But just, like. But his skill set is limited. He's a home run header, dude. But he's, like, I'm telling you, I watched those Steelers and those Bears games. He couldn't do nothing. It was negative yardage. It was embarrassing. He couldn't do nothing. Think the first about, tackle like, think, about their, think about their offensive lines compared to his. Offensive lines make a, a total difference for a running back's entire career. I agree. Like, I'm you think not performance oh, I, here, I guarantee you Nick Chubb isn't Nick Chubb today if he's not in that Cleveland Browns offense. That's without a doubt. Well, we we got to do this off performance. Yeah. So, okay. I know. That's why it's tough because he hasn't played a lot in the last two years. But continue. I think A.J. Dillon's going to have a longevity. Talking about a guy that's unstoppable, okay. 250. Yeah. I mean, that dude, he can run. He can. He, he's awesome. I think A.J. Dillon's going to be better than Aaron Jones in two years. And I have Aaron at number nine. 15, I have Kareem Hunt, which I think that's where Kareem Hunt or Saquon, who's better? Because Kareem has missed time. He's missed. I don't know. Yeah, but like. I I like Kareem Hunt. Yeah, Kareem Hunt's been pretty good. Because remember, uh, if it wasn't for uh, some terrible circumstances, he'd be a number one elsewhere. I didn't get it if you did. You said. Hunt. Yeah, Hunt. Right now. Number 16, I got Damian Harris. Damian Harris or Saquon? I mean, he's been. Damien, because he's been healthy. Yeah. He's, and he's a good running back. He's a solid running back. Well, a name you haven't mentioned, I hope he's freaking next, is where the hell is Josh Jacobs? Oh, he's actually not next to the guy out there. He's, he's actually right after with, like, James Robinson, Leonard Fournette, and Rashad Penny. Number Rashad 17, Penny. I got Miles Sanders. Saquon. Saquon. He's been way more efficient. I, I, Sanders, big Miles Sanders, Sanders has guy. been healthy. He didn't score a touchdown last year, and he's <laughs> And score a touchdown. Yeah, I mean, it's they- committee, though. Boston Scout is getting all those touches. That's the thing. Doesn't yeah, but matter. why was he getting all those touches then? Okay. He's been running with okay, the Okay, okay. <laughs> John's like, okay. So I got Melvin Gordon with Miles Sanders. No, I'll, I'll take Saquon and oh. Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon's got 1,000 yards in all but one season in the NFL. And that one season was one he held out in. That's fine. I'm taking Melvin Gordon. You guys got me? Zero touchdowns. That's that's reasonable because the yard Saquon had two thousand four years ago. So I'll put Saquon above him. You know. The last two years, hey, hey, hey. Miles, Sanders, yards a second Miles Sanders five and a, five point one yards a carry. I look at that and I say performance based, the efficiency there. I mean, he's one of the best running backs to me. And I think if you know Philadelphia didn't have Jalen Hurts and all of those running backs, the committee kind of gained well. I mean, I think he would be scoring half a dozen touchdowns. So, so you guys got me. I had Rashad Penny. James Robinson, Leonard Fournette, DeAndre Swift, Tony Pollard, J.K. Dobbins, then Josh Jacobs. Wow. You wow. Okay. Josh Jacobs is a top 15 running back. Josh yeah. Jacobs is a top 15 running back. There's no. I don't like, think he's on. top 15. Yeah, he's not top 15. I don't what? He has not lived up to uh, yeah. his stat. I think you know, that I'm looking at this stat right now. You realize there's only two players that have broken more tackles than Josh Jacobs. Go ahead and take a guess of those two players. Nick Chubb right? has won. Derrick Henry? Yep. And Derrick Henry, yeah. So, I mean, lived up. I, I'll that, put him behind okay. Damian Harris. Josh but he Jacobs. barely squeezes to, to 1,000 yards. Yeah, last year he had 870. He's making plays. Like, he's still making plays. He, he does though. play a lot. I don't know. I just never like – I, I never mess with him. He's had 1,300, 1,300, 1,200, three years in the NFL. I think he's good. I think I'll oh, – I'm like above Miles Sanders. I was – being a little bit of a disrespectful guy there. Miles Sanders 17. should be at, at number 30 somewhere down there. <laughs> Miles Sanders is underrated. Sorry. Five, yeah. Over five yards yeah. of carry. Yeah. But, yeah, but well, he runs it twice a game. Yeah, his two rushes, he gets 10 yards, five yards of carry. That's what I see it as. So, he was, you know, he, so, so one of the things I, I look at my running backs the way I view fantasy, and, and fantasy 
and fantasy running backs are, are king, you know? They are so king. I, when I look at Josh Jacobs, he's not one of my top of the line backs that I'm looking at because I don't see consistency. Some days he, he doesn't crack 100 yards for you. He might give you 50, 60, and a touchdown. Maybe. Maybe. So I don't have him there for me. Miles Sanders. I think he's, I think he's uh, underrated, man. I we'll think see he's underrated. Mission. We'll see. I, it come, come back to bite me. Save this club, please. Well, Miles Sanders is really good, dude. He's one of the most productive backs in the NFL. I Miles Sanders is a Penn State well. product as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he is. His back, is. former backup, is now outperforming him. He had no touchdowns last year. I don't know if you could say he's outperforming him. Oh. Well, continue. Just, just, That's, just go. I had Saquon at number nineteen. That's I'm going to switch Josh Jacobs and Miles Sanders. I think I was wrong there. I'll, I'll accept due credit because I wasn't studying the the fifteenth and nineteenth quarter, nineteenth uh, running backs in the NFL. For anyone that gets mad at me about that, That's I really right. don't care that much. To be quite honest with you, um, they're all the same. But yeah, I was mostly about performance there. So you'll have Saquon in your top fifteen next year. I think. Just saying. I think he's going to move down. I, yeah, I think I the floor like, for him is where he is right now at 19, just because he hasn't done anything in the last two years. I think he can climb top 12, but staying healthy. Maybe, maybe he just explodes next year. I, that like that would be like a dream come true for me, because I got I got tabs on a lot of my friends who I could talk so much shit to if it, if it changes. So I got like a whole list. So if something I, – I just hope it sparks. I mean, if he's catching the ball and, and scoring touchdowns and they're winning games, I'm fine with that. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I could agree with that running backs in the nfl that's the thing you like i think johnny t you were saying there's a lot of a lot of running backs there's, there's, there's so many and there's always more to come you never know mm-hmm. just who's the next guy in line so we've got Brees hall kenneth walker and many more oh, Gary strong those would be round pick. yeah there's been a, a half a dozen this last year's class that i think we're like probably gonna be mm-hmm. guys getting 15 touches the game this upcoming season so we'll just keep coming i guess last season was very very ugly for a lot of rookie quarterbacks. Trevor Lawrence, one of the best QB prospects since Peyton Manning, looked awful. Zach Wilson, awful. Justin Fields, awful. Mac Jones and surprisingly Davis Mills were the only ones that seemed to have panned out. And Davis Mills would seem to have been found by an accident. So the question is to ask you guys now, should rookie QB start day one? No. I think for the vast majority of these guys. JQ, you want to? Oh, Johnny wants to start it. But did you introduce JQ first? JQ, you want to jump into it first? Because I'm I mean, strong. I, I, you jump in I, first. What Johnny T basically said, I agree with. I think it's hard to throw a quarterback in year one. But like, I get it. Like Trevor Lawrence is the number one overall pick. You need this guy to like lead your team. Like I understand that. I get it. But like, I feel like it's tough because a lot of those top picks are going to bad teams. You know what I'm saying? Like Zach Wilson. The only one that went to a good team was Trey Lance, and he got to basically sit the whole year and kind of learned behind Jimmy G, whatever, you know, he got. Mac Jones. Um, but it's just – I think it's just tough to throw a guy in, like, right away into, like, the fire pit and just be like, all right, like, go out there and, like, produce for us. Like, look at Trevor Lawrence. He had – oh, my God, I'm blanking on his name. Who was his head coach last year? What the heck's the guy's name? Urban Meyer. Yes, Urban Meyer. Yeah, I'm sorry. Urban like, – I forget it because it's – he should forget about that timeline in his career. Yeah, he's got Urban Meyer. The guy's like not even half there, like half the time, like paying attention to. I think it's just hard to win and succeed in a situation like that. And then it makes him look bad. And they're like, oh, he's the number one pick. He should he should shine right away. So I just think it depends where like the player goes. Like Daniel Jones, his first year, he he sat the first two games and and then he ended up playing the third game. They benched Eli. Pat Shermer benched him. So and you know you saw like he had that sick game against the Bucks, but then the rest of the year he was just getting killed turnover prone this and that i just think it i just think it's tough you know um for a quarterback to come in right away and succeed but i think like year two you sit out a year i think a lot of these guys could shine and really show their true potential so i think you look at first overall picks the first guy i think of is alex smith yeah because you look at aaron Rodgers; he was in the same exact draft class Aaron got to sit three years behind Brett Favre. Yeah. Then he flashed it back or flash it forward to 2021. Alex Smith and Steve Young, they're on the table for one of the primetime games. They have a debate whether or not a rookie quarterback should sit. 
Steve Young goes to Tampa Bay as the first overall pick, and it was pretty bad his first two seasons there. And then guess what happened? He got to sit behind Joe Montana. But what Steve Young ended up saying that was in this debate with Alex, I learned more in those two years in Tampa Bay where I struggled than I did in those four, four seasons playing behind Joe Montana. And he says that he's an old school guy. I say to myself, maybe for him that was the case, but for most young quarterbacks today, there is a big difference between sitting behind a Joe Flacco who's been in the NFL for over a decade or even even if it's a Nick Foles or Andy Dalton, a veteran that's been there and you get to see him run your offense, you get to see the mistakes he makes on film, you get to correct those and in practice that game week, you're constantly watching them, you're preparing as if you're going to be the starter. And so you get that expectation of what the NFL is and it could really feel out what it's going to be like when you step in there. Because if I'm a franchise investing a first overall pick into a guy, it's actually a big opportunity. I'm going to do everything I can to set him up to succeed. And the biggest young thing for a quarterback, we were talking about Carson once before, is confidence. It's the belief in oneself. And I look at the NBA. When you throw a quarterback out there or a young player and they suck and they're losing, that changes their mindset in many ways. You were losing your first four years in the NFL. That can affect you because then when it's time to start winning and you've been losing for four straight years, it can really mess with your mind because you're not used to that mentality and your overall approach to the game is different because of all the losses that you've took. And for me, I look at Trevor Lawrence this last season. People are proclaiming him the best quarterback prospect since him or that. I think Joe Joe Burrow was the best quarterback prospect before him since Andy and Andrew uh, Luck. I think an Andrew Luck or Joe Burrow, those are the two best quarterback prospects, in my opinion, since Peyton Manning. Those two guys, I think, you know, you expect them to have the intangible traits and the skill level to completely turn a franchise around. Those are the type of quarterbacks I'm starting week one, especially at the Colts. You cut Peyton Manning because you believe in Andrew Luck that much, you start him week one. And as we saw as a rookie, Andrew Luck led the NFL in comebacks that got to the playoffs in spite of all kinds of adversity. Joe Burrow's rookie tore his ACL, even still. He had a lot of really good games. There were some bad moments, too. I think those are the only two guys in really starting week one. You look at Baker Mayfield and Alex Smith, even a Sam Darnold in New York. You throw those guys out there to the Wolves, and guess what happens? You waste that first-round pick just to trade them years later for a third-rounder. That third-rounder maybe doesn't come nothing. I'm saying screw that. Let's put this young guy like Trey Lance in a situation where he can sit behind a veteran, learn, and most importantly, grow into the best version of himself. So out there. Yeah, I know, but it, a lot of a lot of good uh, points you made. I, 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 I would just I, I would also say uh, to add to that list of QBs that succeeded right off the bat, Cam Newton. He had an incredible, I think, back to back games in uh, first two games in his rookie year. Um, Robert Griffin, of course, is the Rob, Robert about. Griffin was an offensive rookie of the year. He was electric. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's always a, a case by case basis. I, I think just like you know. Like, like we can lay out guys who succeeded from day one and we can lay out guys who failed from day one. Uh, it's all about, it's, it, 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 a lot of factors go into it, you know, situation, um, coaching staff, is this regime uh, that you're uh, uh, with, is it, are they on the hot seat? Will they be fired after one year and you're gonna have to start all over again? Um, stability, confidence, like John said. Uh, player talent around you it has a lot is a, a lot of factors go into it. i mean listen peyton manning had a terrible first year led the league in interceptions but we see how peyton t- uh, panned out um dak prescott he had a great rookie year we've seen uh his career uh take off uh as a um I, for me uh somewhere right outside the top 10 quarterbacks uh yeah, it, it's all about, you know, uh, where you are and what's going on around you. And, you know, sometimes it works out like uh, Andrew Luck and sometimes or uh, or Patrick Mahomes in the case of sitting for a year or Aaron Rodgers or, you know, or sometimes it, uh, you know, flames out like a uh, Blaine Gabbert, or Jake Locker, Christian Ponder, you know, this Blake goes Morris. on and on. You know, I'm, quarterback. I'm a big believer in the saying what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, yeah, if you if your quarterback is clearly the most talented guy out there in the QB room, play him. See what he has. He, everybody's going to go through some growing pains. Why am I going to wait two, three years for him to go through it? I don't, I don't see that. I, I, honestly, 
Think about Jared Goff. Jared Goff walked into a terrible situation with the Rams with Jeff Fisher as his head coach, and it was a disaster when he finally got the quarterback job. And I don't think he started right away that season. He came in later on that year, and it, but it was ugly. And then next season, you know, everything that he went through that previous year, he grew upon it, he built, and then he leads his team to the playoffs, you know, and granted that they had a different head coach. But I, I feel like you should play them, man. I think Zach Wilson will be better because of this. I think Trevor Lawrence, 12 touchdowns, 17 interceptions. He will be better because of it. I think you just got to throw out, throw it out there. I think players are just too soft. If we're going to be like, oh, his confidence is going to be hurt. Oh, my gosh. No, grow the hell up. You're a top pick in the draft. You're making millions of dollars. This is what you're expected to do. You're going to go through it. They knew you were going to go through it. So you play it out. And then if you don't get better from it, then then you just were never the guy in the first place if you can't get better from it. Look, I look at that. You, you guys mentioned RG3. Andrew Luck was in there. Russell Wilson was there. RG3, I think that they all made the playoffs in their rookie season. Am I right? Yeah. Wilson and Griffin, yeah. I believe yep. so, yeah. Yep. yep, just throw them out there, man. They're not kids. They're not kids. They're in their 20s. They're making millions. You play them. Like I said, if they can't handle it, if they play poorly that first year and they can't grow, then they were never your guy in the first place. I get behind that. 100% I get behind that. I, 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 I do agree with that, too, Jay Ray. That was a very good uh, point, too. Very well presented, too, Jay Ray. Appreciate it, bro. Thank you. Very good. I wish Daniel Jones was like that, but, you know, that's all right. <laughs> so. Maybe this year he'll just explode. I don't know. So. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Probably not, though. Maybe the Joneses will go off this year, Brandon. The Joneses. Joneses. That leads us to check it up, I think, since we're done talking about Daniel, fortunately. Two men? Yeah, so uh, two-minute drill. Two-minute drill. Explain you want... this to me. Huh? Explain, Explain this, this to me. We're still inaugurating oh. this idea. For the NBA, it's called Check It Up, where you have an interesting topic that's maybe not worth a full segment, but it's an important headline you want to hit on. It doesn't have to be related to the sport that we dedicated this episode to. So for football listeners, if you made it to this point and you don't want to listen to some MMA stuff we may discuss, thank you for being here. But if you do, you're here along with us for the ride. We're going to have some casual talk. We're going to have some, more importantly, some expert talk. So we're talking a little bit of everything where your your story may be. That's our two-minute drill. And for two minutes, for the NFL stuff, we'll try to keep it under two minutes. But if it's MMA, we'll give you a few more. So I'll keep okay, it short. Cool. Cool. Do you want me to hit it? Yes, yeah, sir. The big thing going on last night. What okay, was it? Okay, so big UFC pay-per-view last night. Um, considerably, it was a quick pay-per-view. Uh, actually, you know, usually it goes on later. Um, for uh, The first four fights of the uh, main card all ended in finish. Uh, the main event was a uh, five-round decision. Um, I was going to go over the uh, full main card, but I'm just going to skip to um, the co-main event and main event. I want to just hit on those two. Uh, so in the co-main event, we have Brandon Moreno versus Kai Car France for the interim flyweight championship, a rematch from a couple of years ago. Uh, the, the fight uh, was different from their first fight. It was a little less action-packed through the first two rounds. Um, uh, much more technical. Uh, the first two rounds I had it, you could either have it going 1-1 or uh, 2-0 for uh, Moreno, but I definitely think round two went to Moreno. He was uh, uh, starting to uh, take over in that round. Um, then in the third round, uh, the uh, complexion of the fight changed. Kai Car France started to uh, land some big shots. Uh, he was able to get on top of um, Brandon Moreno. He, he started looking like he was going to, you know, take over he was winning that round but uh, uh later in the round uh brandon moreno lands a, a nice uh, combo on uh kai car france and uh as uh france is backing up moreno throws a uh, left body kick and the uh toe of brandon moreno literally digs square into the uh midsection of kai car france shuts his body off he drops to the floor uh moreno Gets on top of him, lands a couple of shots. The ref calls in, ends in. It's a TKO win for Brandon Moreno. Who I, so he's the new interim uh, flyweight champion, but I believe he's the uncrowned, undisputed flyweight champion. So now he's going to move into the uh, fourth fight, 
the fourth installment in the uh, Brandon Moreno, Davis, and Figueredo uh, saga. First fight was two years ago in December. Greatest flyweight uh, t- uh, fight of all time. Ended in a draw. Ran it back uh, the next year in July. Moreno absolutely dominated uh, Figueredo. Finished him in under three. Then they fought a third time, I think, earlier this year in January, I believe. And it was a uh, super, super close fight. A lot more technical than the first two fights. Not as a lot of action as the first two fights. And uh, I believe Moreno won it. But the three judges that night gave it to Figueredo, so he won. We expected to have the fourth fight right after that. Uh, Figueredo uh, refused to fight Moreno because uh, he felt uh, Moreno was saying this, some disrespectful things about him, which I find a little funny because Brandon Moreno, if you if you just listen to the guy on interviews or uh, his fellow fighters or um, MMA reporters, uh, the boss, Dana White, talk about him. He's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Uh, he's got nothing bad to say and and it showed at the end of the fight in his uh, his post-fight interview he uh, David Figueroa Figueredo was called into the octagon they had a little face off and Moreno uh, basically said face to face to him he was like listen uh, I don't hate you Uh, I like you I respect you I I hope that you can forgive me if I've said anything that offended you or anything and uh, I forgive you for anything that you've said against me and he basically said, I want to, I could come in here and, uh, you know, talk trash to you and belittle you. But uh, I think about my family at home, my kids, my wife, all the fans uh, around the world. And I said, uh, he says to himself, um, I want to be a better example and a good role model. So he puts his, uh, extends his hand for a handshake. They shake hands and uh, the beef is squashed. So now we're moving on to the fourth fight, hopefully later this year in December maybe earlier next year, but that fourth fight is going to be the first time in UFC history two guys fight uh, four times. Um, And then in the main event, a lot of emotions for Brandon in this fight because I I love me some Amanda Nunes. Um, So Amanda Nunes, uh, the GOAT of the women's uh, MMA, in my opinion, lost her last fight against Juliana Pena. She got submitted in the second round. And I kind of went into that a little bit, so I won't go into it right now in the uh, the last episode that we did. So the first round, um, you know, starts off kind of slow, you know, methodical. I I give the round to Nunez, um, and I tweeted throughout the entire fight, so I'm I'm just going to basically read them uh, verbatim. So uh, the first uh, round one to Nunez, Pena had a couple nice flurries, but Nunez controlled the majority of that round and was the aggressor. Going into round two was... Round two was stuff of champions. It's what champions are made of. Uh, Amanda Nunes knocked her down three different times. Absolutely dominated her. It was a 10-8 round. Um, She fought so smart and so patient. Every time she knocked her down, all three times, she could have engaged on the ground, but she decided not to because she was beating her up on the feet. And she basically said, get back up. Let's do this again. Let's go. I'm not going to go down there because... That's what led to um, my defeat last time, which uh, knocked off my uh, gas tank. So she didn't engage, which I thought was uh, incredible. Going into round three, then I was shocked. And Nunez decided to engage in the grappling department with uh, Pena. She, she started to take her down. She was being really effective, which landed some big shots. She landed some nice elbows, one that split uh, um, Pena wide open right on the hairline of the uh, uh, head. Uh, she started gushing blood throughout the rest of the fight. Uh, now, I will say Pena was showing some uh, good techniques. She was trying to get a triangle in. She was trying to arm bar. She was trying to Oma Plata. She tried a bunch of different things to try and submit Amanda, but Amanda was just one step ahead of her and was just playing the smart game, not overextending on the ground. Uh, going into the fourth round, it was a hard-fought round. That was probably the most grueling round of the fight for both of them. Because that's the round that Pena really made Nunez work on the ground, where she was on uh, Pena was on her back, but she was making her work every second of that round. Uh, and she had three attempts in the Oma Plata, which is a hard thing to explain. But if you saw it, each time Pena had Nunez's glove, which is against the rules, you're not allowed to grab the glove. The referee didn't notice the last two times, but it was neither here nor there. Uh, the fight played out how it played out. She didn't get submitted, so. She had her in an arm bar, a tight arm bar, uh, 
somewhere in the fourth or fifth round. I forget exactly. But uh, Amanda said after the fight that it wasn't really that tight. I wasn't in danger, really. I was fine. So, but you saw Pena crank her in her face. She was like, this is my last effort. This was it. She didn't get it done. And then the fifth round was pretty much the same. She just took uh, Pena down. Pena tried to throw up submissions and stuff, but nothing was working. So I, I tweeted out, the GOAT is back. Double champ twice this is a two-time double champ now another record in the legacy of amanda nunez uh the, the fight ended in uh in my opinion it was 50 44 um so i love it and uh i can't i hope the next fight is um valentina shevchenko versus amanda nunez the trilogy those are the two best female fighters of all time on this planet and uh i would love to see them run it back for the third time it was dominating performance, just constantly taking her to the ground with ease. It was insane. It was. Three knockdowns, one round. Uh, I don't have anything for this week for the two minute drill. Justin, you got some? Yeah, I'll keep it quick. Uh, since we were talking about some New York Giant football, I'd like to just talk about New York football in general. What the hell are we doing, man? We live in the greatest city in the world. We got the greatest baseball team. Our two baseball teams are fighting right now for first place. Our football teams need to wake up, man. I, and I hate both of them. But for the sake of the city that I love so much, New York, wake the hell up. We haven't had a winning season. Some I, I get stuck watching the, the New York teams every single week. For the sake of a damn football fan, give me a product worth watching this season. I don't want to see 4-13. and 13. I don't want to see 3-14. and 14. So give me a team that I get to sit there and enjoy and, enjoy and see the morning paper. On, on Monday morning, Giants did something. Jets did something worth talking about. We live, like I said, this is a tough city. And, and these football teams, this is the toughest sport. They got to embody this city. They got to play tough. It can't just be the Yankees and the Mets and the Rangers, man. It's already enough. I could, I could go talk crap about the Knicks. The Nets are already going to go downhill now, too. This, this football season, we have to have something to feel good about, have some pride about our city, man, because we used to have parades here all, left and right. I haven't had a parade for my team since 2009. The Giants' last one was, what, 2011? Yes, 2011, 2012 season, yeah. Okay. New, we need something. We need a little just, celebration. Just one uh, thing, Justin. I love it because it's something I touched on earlier. There's one team that you didn't match, which is the forgotten New York team. The Buffalo Bills. No. <laughs> yeah, they don't count. They, they could win. This is why they're... I said when I did that fun little topic, the Bills need to leave Buffalo. I know Buffalo loves them, but they're always forgotten as a New York team. Go to Canada. It'll be great. Yeah, that's right. Right. If, they, if they win, everybody in the city won't give a damn. Their parade isn't in, in, the, in downtown. Buffalo. Justin is basically there, saying what Stephen A. said. New York, stand up. We here. No, nah, we ain't here yet. We, Wait, I, 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 I want I want us to be. We got some. Yeah. No, but maybe we might be celebrating a little something in October. I hope so. I hope so. And I, I guess something I can close out with too. If you're a baseball fan or not, and you're looking for something to watch, go watch, go watch the Yankees, and just go watch Aaron Judge play. If you're not a big baseball fan, you got to do it. The the guys, he's he's gonna. I think he's gonna shatter some records this year, and just. The, how consistent he is game in and game out. Like, you know, it, it's hard to do that in 182 games. So if you want to witness some history, just someone who's really betting on himself and taking a chance on a one-year contract right now, like that's the guy right now. So go so go check that out, definitely. For 42 sure. home runs, and it's not even August yet. Got still what, like 60 games left maybe, something like that? So, <laughs> Do you guys consider the record with the steroid use at – 80 or what have you, or do you consider yeah. it at 61 for the AL? I think that's what it was. It's the AL 61, right? 61. Yeah. But then Barry Bonds has the record of like 73 in, in the yeah. I mean 73 or 72. Uh, I don't remember the exact. I mean, well, hell with that. I mean, he's already at four, 42 home runs now. He got 60 games. You never know, but I think he'll reach that 60 mark for sure. I think so. I think uh I maybe mean, he's gonna in his last 14 games, he has 12 home runs. It's it's a it's mm -hmm. fine. I don't know, man. He he's he's he's, got, on, he's, he's batting five hundred over his last twelve. Yeah. Yankees, give the man the money, pay him. We have it, pay him. That's all I gotta say. We can wrap up on that. Little Johnny Manziel. 
Well, Johnny Man's out. Get <laughs> money. Guys, oh, I just want to say, too, like, I really appreciate you guys having me on. This is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's always good. I think I said in the beginning, I said CBS. I meant CSB, by the way. CSB. I, I heard that in my voice. I was like, wait, hang on. What did I say? But anyway, like, you know, I'm happy we made a friendship and, uh, you know, that we still keep in touch. Um, it's really nice. Yeah. You guys are doing a great job with the show. Uh, it's popping up on my TikTok for you page. That, that's how you know you're doing a good job. So uh, good job, guys. It's, it's always good to hear from you guys. Always a pleasure. And let's just hope our teams for football are good. And, you know, the teams we respectfully root for. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all I got to say. So thanks again, guys. I, I, I appreciate it a lot. A this lot. is Thank you for coming on. appearance, but it definitely will not be his last. Of course. Thank okay. you. If you want to give your uh, Twitter or something where people can follow you or see what you're doing. Yeah, just uh, at Jack Dash Quarteraro. It's a, it's a long name to spell out. Um, but we got you, the we got the pop up. Yeah, definitely yeah, put it on the screen. Um, but yeah, no, I'm definitely gonna get you know my podcast up and running again in the fall. I'm talking Big Blue with JQ. Um, if you're looking for Giants content, and you need a guy. I'm always spitting it out. So once the season really you know starts to kick underway, I'm gonna start getting back into it. So, but guys, once again, appreciate you boys. What, what a blast it was, and yeah. I'll, I'll, Let's go. Yes, indeed. That was episode number 13. 13. Dustin, send us off, baby. Let's go. All right. All right, Wise Guys fans. Thank you for listening. You know the deal. Follow us on our socials. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. We love y'all. Stay classy. Peace.